Ken, and we are we are now live on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Rushcliffe Borough Council Planning Committee. Uh, I'm Councillor Roger Upton, and uh, I'm chairman of this committee. And with us uh, this afternoon, to my left, your right, Councillor Maureen Stockwood, who is uh, my vice chairman, and other councillors on the committee present are, I believe, uh, Phillips, Murray, Healy, Mason, Thomas, Gray, Herdu Horan, Butler, and Jones. We will mention the substitutions and absences later on, but um, welcome to you. And also present from the officer side are, and I'd like to welcome for the first time in, in, over there, um, uh, Andrew Ashcroft, who is the interim head of planning, who stepped in whilst An uh, Andrew Pegram is on a long-term sick leave. So welcome, Andrew, to your first meeting of this committee. I'm sure you'll uh, take the opportunity to meet some of the committee members that you haven't met already uh, after the meeting. Um, also, we've got Rebecca Sells, a principal solicitor, Helen Tambini, Democratic Services Manager, Tracy Coop, Democratic Services, with Laura Webb of the same, and planning officers, Emily Dodds, Paul Taylor, and Phil Cook. If I've missed anybody else out, my apologies, but I think that's covered most people. Welcome to you all. Um, firstly, and hopefully fairly briefly, some basic housekeeping issues. There is no alarm, fire alarm expected this afternoon, but it should sound if you follow the exit signs out through those doors there, out to the foyer, and assemble in the main entrance plaza, which is uh, outside the main entrance to the building. If that's confusing, follow one of us. Um, mobile phones, the usual, if you could turn them off or to silent, that would be appreciated. They can be quite a distraction if they... Uh, ring during the meeting. Uh, the public toilets are off the main entrance for you. If anybody feels the necessity, please just uh, get up and leave the meeting. No offence taken if you need to. So, item one on the agenda is the apologies for absence and substitute members. There have been a few changes, so I'll ask uh, Democratic Services if they could just inform us who's substituting for who. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We have um, apologies from Councillor Clark, Councillor Bailey, and Councillor Gowland, and we have substituted this evening uh, or this afternoon Councillor Phillips, Councillor Butler, and Councillor Murray. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second item on the agenda, as usual, is declarations of interest. Now, it, it is pertinent this afternoon where there is a county council uh, application, agenda item two, where the borough council is a consultee. So, where the borough council is a consultee for a county council application, any county council members and ward members of this committee need to step down from the committee uh, and they declare their interest as a county councillor or a ward councillor for these applications and confirm that they will consider the application with an open mind uh, and listen to debate as it unfolds uh, with no predetermined views. Uh, are there any declarations to be made now from county councillors? And I'll start the ball rolling if I may with myself being on the County Council's Planning Committee, I declare an interest there on um, Agenda Item 2, the East Leak application, and I will certainly be leaving the committee for that item, and I will hand over to Councillor Stockwood, my Vice Chairman. But I, I know there are some other County Councils in the room that may want to make a, a declaration now. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, for the same reasons as yourself, I declare a, 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 a non-prejudicial interest in, or non-pecuniary interest in item number two, which is the land north of Remsen Road in East Leek, because I'm also on the County Council's Planning Committee and indeed chairing the meeting. So I will be leaving the, this meeting for this item. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Councillor Perdue Horan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for the same reason, I will also join you uh, by leaving the meeting for item two, uh, as I am also on the county planning committee, and I hope we have a quorum <laughs> after we've left. Quite. Thank you for that. Um, there's no other county councillors present, so are there any other declarations under the Code of Conduct or the Planning Code from members of the committee? Thank you, 
Mr Chairman, I would just like to declare an interest in the second application as I am the ward member for East Lee. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Right, agenda item three is the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 14th of October this year. Our members of the committee agree that these minutes are correct, and if so, may I have a proposal and a seconder, please? Proposed by Vice Chair Councillor Stockwood, seconded by Councillor Phillips. Thank you. So we can now move on to item four of the agenda, which is to discuss this afternoon's planning applications. Uh, firstly, I'd like, as usual, to remind members, particularly members that are substituting today, I assume you've read all the reports, and I would make the opportunity to just say now, have you all read the quite considerable late representations? If not, please, please indicate, and I'll adjourn the meeting for five or ten minutes if you wish to do that. But I looking around, everybody's content that they've read the late representations. Thank you. Um, again, if, if you can try not to repeat the same points that's been made by your colleagues uh, and keep the comments fairly concise and relevant, I think that would be appreciated uh, given the, the business we have this afternoon. Uh, and again, it's a quasi-judicial meeting that should be conducted with the appropriate professionalism and behaviour and only material planning issues should really be debated because sometimes we do get wandering off onto non-material planning issues. Um, right, we could note the report of the Director of Growth and Economic Development now, I think, which gives an overview of the planning process and the applications to be considered this afternoon. And that takes us to the first application, uh, which is reference 20 zero forward slash zero two six seven zero forward slash full land at hillside farm bunny lane keyworth erection of 77 dwellings with landscaping public open space and associated infrastructure revised scheme um, i would now ask uh, the planning officer to my right henry dodd if they are well, they are late representations which you would like to refer to, Emily, at this stage, and then over to you to uh, give your presentation, if you could. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, yes, as, as committee members um, are aware, late representations have been received and circulated. Um, chairman officers have carefully considered these late representations. As you say, they, they are lengthy um, this month. Um, however, we consider that they don't raise any new or different material planning considerations which have not already been taken into account and considered, um, or that would result in any change to the recommendation other than changes to conditions which have been set out by the case officer on your late representations sheet. Thank you. Uh, uh, your presentation. Thank you, Chairman. So if we move the slide down to the, uh, the site, um, the site itself um, is located on the western edge of Keyworth as you leave the village on Bunny Lane. Um, opposite the site, on the opposite side of Bunny Lane, is the Bloors development site. On that plan there, it's just shown as green fields. Um, however, having visited the site recently, it is being built out. It has planning permission for 221 dwellings, um, and quite a lot of them have been built and some of them occupied. The application site itself, which is in the red line area, um, is occupied by Hillside Farmhouse, which is um, to the um, western side of the site. And there is also um, a barn within the red line. Both of those are to be demolished um, to make way for this housing site. The existing access is proposed to be blocked up and a new access created off Bunny Lane. Um, to the west, we have farmland and barns. To the east is the residential properties. Um, and immediately to the east, sharing a boundary with the site, is um, Rosings Close. Um, we've got a sewage treatment plant, which is just off the side of your, your screen, I'm afraid, down to the southwestern corner. I don't know if um, Mr. Cook can just hover his mouse in the correct location. There is a sewage treatment plant. Um, between about 150 and 200 metres away down, down there. Um, the site itself does slope from north to south, and the slope varies between 10 to 14 metres, so it's 
so it's a reasonable slope to the site. Um, along the southern boundary, there is a ditch and public footpath and a hedgerow along there. There's also um, a ditch along the eastern boundary with Rosings Close and post and rail fence and hedgerow. The, um, the other boundaries are hedgerow. Um, some of the boundary to the northern to Cadunny Lane will need to be removed as part of the development um, and later replaced. But I'll get on to that a little bit further, Chairman. Um, I'll just take you through some of my site photographs. So this is the frontage along Bunny Lane, and this is looking back east towards the village. Um, um, this is the existing entrance to um, Hillside Farm on the left and the neighbouring farm on the right. And then a, a little bit better photo there where you can see the existing house just peeking through above the fence um, and hedge. And to the right hand side of the photo is the barn there that's going to be demolished. This photograph's taken looking west, which um, eventually you end up at the Penrock um, Lane Junction, which is um, where a, a new mini roundabout is proposed. Uh, this is 37 Bunny Lane, so the site can be glimpsed through the gap next to, to that property's garage. And then standing a little bit further back, this is taken from the Bloor site and just looks across Bunny Lane down towards the application site. And then a more zoomed in the, uh, version of that photograph with Roseland Close on the left hand side of your screen. You can just see the slow, site sloping down um, towards its um, southern boundary with the hedgerow. This is a picture taken of the southern boundary and you'll see that um, silo access which is um, marked where the public footpath goes along the southern boundary. So the application site is on the other side of that, that hedge. Um, and then this just gives you an idea of um, the public footpath that runs at the end of Roselands Close um, between Roselands and Brooklands. And the, the site is again on that, uh, the left hand side um, behind the houses there. So these next few photos were taken from um, a local residence property and they were taken at the beginning of the year. So things have moved on a little since these were taken, but this just shows, oh, this just shows you looking back towards the um, existing farm buildings and we can see there the frame of the third farm um, barn that is um, under construction at the time these photos are being taken. And then further views from that residence property, you can see here the post, uh, the rail fence, um, hedgerow and at the forefront of the picture is actually where the ditch lies on the eastern boundary. So it just gives you a view across those open fields there. And further zoom into the barns on the neighbouring farm. And similarly, views across the site towards the neighbouring farm. Um, and another view there, we've got the southern boundary, the hedge, and the eastern boundary. And then just to, to give an idea of some of the levels, some of the houses along Roselands are, are raised up um, from the ground level, which you can see from the patio. If I move on to the plans now, Chairman. So this is our application site and our proposed layout. We can see there is um, a play area located on that um, western side, which is the grey the gray square. We've got an attenuation pond um, for surface water down in the southwestern corner. And then the, the housing and road layout um, concentrated on the rest of the site. So I'm section us through the site now, which also gives you an idea of street scenes. So members will be able to see from that the, the site does, does slope fairly steeply. This has been taken into account by the um, applicant when designing the layout. And further sections across the site. And then a plan just indicating where the affordable housing is proposed to be located. So we've got 15 plots of affordable housing, a mix of type and tenure, which are indicated on the plan there in the various colours. Okay. Um, 
the site is allocated for housing under policy 4.4 of local plan part two. Policy 4.4 contains four criteria, Chairman, um, which I'll just briefly run through for the benefit of members. Criteria A is that amenity of residents shouldn't be significantly affected by noise, odour, dust or dust resulting from the activities of the neighbouring farm. And criteria B reverses that in terms of the continuation of the agricultural operations at the neighbouring farm shouldn't be prejudiced as a result of adverse effects on the amenity of residents. So in terms of those, those two points, um, officers have managed to negotiate a buffer area along that um, western boundary. There would be proposed to be a three metre high fence along that boundary as well, sitting on the inside of the hedgerow, which um, would help to buffer from noise, as well as enhanced glazing and ventilation to properties along that side of the development. Um, environmental health officers are in receipt of technical reports on noise, odour and dust and are satisfied and more detail on this can be seen in paragraphs 26 to 34 of the reports. Um, so Chairman, officers are satisfied on criteria A and B in terms of amenity of residents and continued operation of the farm. In terms of criteria C, this relates to financial contributions to a package of improvements for the A52 between the A6005 and the A46 Bingham. Highways England have been approached and consulted, but they've confirmed that the level of trips generated as a result of this development would not justify that financial contribution, and therefore it is not being sought as part of this application. Um, criteria D ensures that the, um, the application should be consistent with other relevant policies in the plan. So in terms of these other material considerations, the neighbourhood plan has been thoroughly considered in the um, committee report, paragraphs 139 to 161, and is broadly in accordance with the neighbourhood plan, apart from some slight departure in policy H2, which is the, the mix of, um, of housing. The site lies within 200 metres of a sewage treatment plant. Seven Trent have been approached again and consulted, but does not impose a cordon for development um, in relation to this sewage treatment plant. Detailed landscaping proposals will also be secured by condition. Um, for clarity, this will include the northern boundary hedge requiring to be removed to provide a footway, but will be replaced by what's termed an instant hedge, which is a, a more mature planting scheme uh, once those works have ca been carried out. The southern hedge boundary will require some stocking up. Western boundary will have the three metre fence um, previously referred to, and the eastern boundary will be subject to a detailed landscaping proposal, which is required by way of condition. Uh, ecological surveys have also been undertaken at the site, and the recommendations of the reports are um, followed by the conditions, including a follow up walkover by the ecologist prior to any work commencing. In terms of design and amenity, um, we've had considerable concern identified by local residents and existing neighbours, particularly from Roseland Close, regarding the ditch on the eastern boundary and the levels and back-to-back -back distances. Um, Chairman, at this point, if I could just um, reiterate to the matter laid out in the late representations regarding the ditch, um, officers accept there's some confusion over this matter due to the way it's been reported um, in the committee report. Um, we would clarify that the ditch along the eastern and southern boundary don't fall within an environment agency definition of designated watercourse um, and that this matter and related policy 19 requirements have been the subject of lengthy discussions with both the environment agency and our policy colleagues which have resulted in our recommendation. Um, so in terms of those ditches they do lie outside the application site um, matters of ownership and riparian rights are not planning matters for us to consider as part of the application. Um, and whilst we accept there's a reduced buffer of three metres on the eastern boundary, um, the application has been subject to additional scrutiny, um, as I say, by the Environment Agency and our policy colleagues. And as the ditch is not a designated watercourse, the application of the policy in this way is considered to be justified and be a proportionate response um, to, that, to that ditch and its function. Um, three metres would allow an adequate space for the maintenance vehicle to access it, 
to provide any, any works that are required and also space for some natural habitat. Um, the additional sections which we looked at earlier have been provided um, to better demonstrate the topography of the site. They don't alter the levels on the site or change where any of those houses are located. They simply offer additional clarity um, both for residents and for members when considering the application. Um, we do acknowledge that the plans don't show existing property extensions. This has been raised on previous applications, I think, Chairman, and we've, we've clarified that applicants can only survey the land in their control to that level of detail. But officers are satisfied having carried out site visits, um, that there is satisfactory um, distance. And our residential design guide, as an adopted supplementary planning document, is guidance only. Design policy in the National Planning Policy Framework is warn LPAs, or local, local planning authorities, sorry, against being too prescriptive on design um, and significant works being undertaken to ensure the design and appearance of the new properties along with retaining walls and boundary treatments to mitigate any significant harm. Uh, just to add, Chairman, that a unilateral undertaking has been submitted by the applicant and this encompasses off-site highway improvements including the roundabout bus stop improvements and bus taster tickets. This includes 15 affordable houses, an open space scheme, which includes the sustainable urban drainage system, the play area, the fence to the western boundary, the east and buffer strip, and management to company to maintain these areas. Um, the unilateral agreement does also include some additional um, points on access arrangements to the ditch on the eastern boundary. Um, all other matters, um, such as the health and secondary school contributions, will be picked up under the community infrastructure levy rather than by a separate legal agreement. And we've had no request for a contribution for primary schools. Therefore, Chairman, um, the development is before you with a recommendation that the Director for Development and Economic Growth is authorised to grant planning permission, subject to completion of the satisf satisfactory unilateral undertaking, the conditions set out in the report and the amendments um, contained within the late representations. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, this takes us to the point where we have three speakers for this application. Uh, the first one is, I believe, Robert Galaije, if I pronounce that usually correctly. Gali. Gali. For uh, Barrett Holmes, the applicant. So, if you care to come to the seat in front there, um, when you're ready at the table, you have up to five minutes to speak. When you're ready to start, just press the microphone button and that will illuminate the red light uh, and we will start the clock then and you'll be told when you've got 30 seconds left. We are quite strict on the timing. So, when you're ready, uh, press the button. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Members, officers, observers. Robert Galley, Planning Director, Barrett, David Wilson Holmes. Chairman, the principle of residential development is established via the formal Greenbelt release and the status of this uh, particular site as a housing land allocation in the Rushcliffe Local Plan Part 2, 2019. Indeed, the site was endorsed by all borough councillors at the time uh, via the adoption process in October 2019. Since then, extensive discussion, dialogue and negotiation has occurred with your officers across all relevant borough council departments, functions and responsibilities to test our proposed scheme against established planning policy. As we've heard in this regard, critically is key policy 4.4 of local plan part two in terms of setting a high bar against which development proposals are to be uh, assessed. Considerable dialogue, discussion and negotiation has also occurred with external statutory consultees including the Local Highway Authority, Environment Agency, Lead Local Flood Authority and the Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. Chairman, all aimed at addressing key issues and concerns, removing objections and reaching a satisfactory outcome. Chairman, I confirm there are no outstanding objections to the proposed scheme from statutory consultees covering policy and technical matters. Similarly, I confirm we have met the four high bar tests in policy 4.4 of your local plan part two with your officers. A settled position is now reached with all relevant parties embracing appropriate and suitable mitigation, ensuring an acceptable scheme in planning terms. Regrettably, some stakeholders 
still object, namely Keyworth Parish Council and neighbouring residents. And Chairman, we have engaged through discussion, dialogue and public consultation with them, endeavouring wherever possible to narrow differences and address collective concerns through scheme changes, layout revisions, reciting of plots and reduction in numbers. On a more positive note, 25% of the representations received support our proposed scheme and the prospect of major residential development at this location, which is refreshing and most welcomed. The planning policy section in the committee report is endorsed. Similarly, the appraisal, its content and the assessment undertaken are also endorsed. Indeed, it is comprehensive and thorough, addressing all relevant planning policies and material planning considerations affecting and indeed impacting on this particular site. As we've heard, planning obligations and SIL have been tested and addressed, and the content of the Section 106 agreement unilaterally offered uh, is settled, and approximately £511,000, I believe, is the anticipated financial receipt ultimately for SIL, of which approximately 128000 is destined for Keyworth Parish Council as the neighbourhood plan recipient. The conclusion in the committee report is supported, as indeed is the recommendation, welcomed accordingly. And as we've heard, conditions have been discussed and commentary fed back to your officers. They too are now settled. In summary, a planning balance has now been struck, culminating in a form of development which has been thoroughly tested and is considered acceptable. I commend the proposed scheme to the planning committee and urge members to endorse the recommendation, thereby enabling the first provision of much needed housing, 77 units in Keyworth, of which 15 are affordable and 62 open market based. Second, to help meet the Borough Council's approved strategic housing requirement of 600 dwellings for Keyworth in the local plan period 2011 through to 2028, and to ensure and enable a continuous supply of housing land in Keyworth and across Rushcliffe Borough over the next five years. And finally, Chairman, confidence in delivery. The applicant, Barrett David Wilson Homes, has a proven track record of delivering local plan strategic sites, major residential development across Rushcliffe. This one would be no exception, reflecting good design, master planning, and comprehensive infrastructure provision, both on site and off site. Approval of this planning application enables us to deliver this acceptable proposal with its associated economic, social, and planned Perfect. environmental benefits for Keyworth and Rushcliffe Borough accordingly. I urge you to recommend and accept the endorsement accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. While we uh, vacate the table, we'll give it a, a bit of a wipe for anti-COVID, and then our next speaker can be invited. Our next speaker is Mary Butler, an objector. Um, I'd like to take the table, Mary. The same rules, you have up to five minutes to speak. When you're ready to start, press the microphone button, the red light will show. We will start the clock and you'll be told when you have 30 seconds left. So when you're ready. Press the button when you, when you, oh, okay. My name is Mary Butler. I have lived at Nine Roseland Close, immediately adjacent to the bottom right of this plan for 21 years. This makes me pretty expert on the sensitive site with its numerous constraints. Apologies for my lack of polish, but I've only had a week's notice that this application was to come before you today. Only a week's notice that Rushcliffe Borough Council intended to unilaterally rewrite, or rather rip up, local policy plan 19. Policy 19 requires a minimum 10 metres, completely undeveloped buffer, not fence gardens, not roads, not houses, do every watercourse. It's a watercourse affected by development. 
a buffer illustrated by the additional red lines running from north to south in and and this picture. There should be one across the bottom. These buffers are minimum needed for wildlife corridors and maintenance. I am currently responsible for the entirety of the watercourse next to my property, and I have carefully nurtured the wildlife alongside it. I cannot believe Rushcliffe will be recommending acceptance of an application for unnecessary houses where the, this policy is so comprehensively be trashed by a de developer. Policies that protect wildlife habitats and mature intact hedgerows must never be watered down for the apparent convenience of applicants. But it's not just this policy. Officers have failed with significant rigour, and I will explain as much as I can in five minutes. Against development policy, this policy report fails to explain why 77 homes is necessary or justifiable on the site. There is no overriding development policy need for this site. 77 houses are not required for Keyworth to deliver on its LPP2 allocation. Sites already under development in Keyworth are delivering all 600 homes required by LPP2. LPP2 assess Keyworth as only being sustainably able to take 590 homes, not more. Rushcliffe have a secure five-year housing supply. This site is not in Keyworth's democratically supported neighbourhood plan. Officers incorrectly use overriding public interest in provision of housing to justify development and lower standards of, of policy. But all requirements to the level of housing have been met. Keyworth has not been assessed as being sustainable for the excess homes this site will create. So this development cannot pass this test. The assessment of suitability for 70 homes for LPP2 was made before building and occupation by up to 800 cows of the three industrial barns. Against planning policy, this report fails to accurately assess against numerous policies. It's fully applied. It would show 77 homes cannot be accommodated on the site. If you didn't have the time to visit, here's a quick shot of the mature, intact, six-metre-high hedge on the southern boundary. The retention of this hedge at this height to screen any development from the footpath was one of the justifications for this site in LPP2. Officers seem to have forgotten that. No need to do any infilling if you don't deliberately destroy large hedges by siting houses where they do not need to be. The primary room of biodiversity net gain is do no harm. LPP sustainability policy six and seven failed. Only 20 metre separation window design guide 30 metres is recommended. Officers are mistaken in their late representations. There must either be demonstration on how adequate provision will, will achieve or some decent separation. Policy four failed, design guide failed. Two metres cannot be everything. There is no space for any landscaped buffer to the eastern periphery of the site as per paragraph seven committee report between plots 58 to 68 and 9 and 11 Roseland Close. This is a misrepresentation of fact and a failure of KNP policy H3 requiring a landscaped buffer. Lack of amenity for new residents in plot 58 to 68, major overlooking. The balcony and first floor living room at 9 Roseland Close are less than 25 metres distance. They overlook the entire gardens and into all of the rear windows of plot 58 to 68. 10 properties that will be totally overlooked with no privacy. Design guide policy failed. The words of the person who farms the adjacent land and owns the barns. You have my handout. I'll read an extract. Smell, noise and vermin are inevitable in livestock farming. No explanation needed. I live 150 metres away. I am affected by noise and flies and smells. It's obvious new residents will be. 4.4 failed. And if the noise and flies weren't bad enough, the quality of life for residents of plot five will be even worse. Their garden is sunk four metres down, completely overshadowed and receives no direct sunlight for the majority of the year. Amenity of new residents failed again. This photo was supplied by accident to RBC, not a planning matter, but I've called it a confused applicant. For their own self-serving ends, the applicants have publicly claimed to own the Eastern Watercourse and then publicly claimed not to. They have fed Rushcliffe planning whatever suited their current position. What is worse, though, is they have refused numerous requests from myself to clear up that confusion and agree the legal boundary. This application is just not good enough to be either approved on development or planning policy. It fails entirely against LPP sustainability policies one, two, three, four, seven, and eight, and so many more, but I've run out of time. Thank you, and I urge you, have courage, think hard about what's Thank the you. right thing to do, and refuse this application. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Always difficult to get in the five minutes, but well done. Now, our third speaker, fingers crossed, is a remote technical challenge for us. It's coming from elsewhere in the country from Councillor Andrew Edivy. See him there on the screen, so it's looking good. Can you hear us, Andrew? 
I can hear you. And before I start, can I double check that everyone can hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. When you feel you want to start, indicate and we'll, we'll set the clock running. OK, um, just to correct, first of all, the first speaker. Yes, all three ward councillors voted for local plan part two, but only after we were assured that local plan part two would still allow us to object if necessary to specific sites. And I'm interrupting my holiday today to try and convey the depth of feeling in the community, not just from immediate neighbours. Right. When are you starting the clock at? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, I, I would start it now then. I, to be honest, I'd started it when I said started speaking. Well, we'll start the clock now. OK, so the first reason that myself and fellow ward members object to this application is because it flies in the face of local democracy. Keyworth has a neighbourhood plan, which was four years in the making. And in the course of the process, residents accepted the need for development, firstly, in local plan part one of at least 450 dwellings, and latterly, through the adoption of the neighbourhood plan, arise to around 600 dwellings. As has already been said, these 600 dwellings have already been given permission, and I can think of a number of small sites around the village where there'll be more infill and further developments, and I would anticipate planning permission without this site of around at least 650 dwellings in the not too distant future being granted in Keyworth. This easily fulfills Keyworth's share of housing in the borough. This site was not in the neighbourhood plan. And when it was first considered by that plan committee, it was quickly rejected as the least suitable. It was included in LP2 very much against the spirit of the neighbourhood plan and its proposed development is seen locally as ignoring the democratically approved neighbourhood plan, which was voted for with a 30% turnout. And I see this as much as anything as a, an affront to local democracy. However, the biggest reason that myself and our and other two ward councillors object to this site is that in considering local plan part two, the inspector made a clear recommendation with regard to this site. These have already been referenced today and they are in paragraph 43 of the officer's report, but I'm going to reread them again. Firstly, the amenity of residents should not be significantly affected by noise, odor or dust resulting from the neighboring farm. Secondly, there are no prejudicial implications upon the activities of the farm as a result of any impacts on amenity. You will note that the farmer is one of the objectors to this application. He certainly is fearful that complaints from the occupiers, should this go ahead, will threaten his livelihood. The report details the noise and dust reports but these have not been carried out at times when the farm has been fully operational. And in, and in that sense, I think they are really not worth the, the, the paper they're written on. These reports are also largely desk-based. There have been some measurements taken at the wrong times, but they are desk-based and they are theoretical. The developers say that they've taken extra measures within the design um, to soundproof housing, but you cannot triple glaze gardens. I also note that at no time has any consideration been given to the likely insect density that invariably goes with having a huge number of livestock nearby. And I know from experience of living in the country that such close proximity will bring its inherited increase in insect population. This will not allow new residents to enjoy the amenity of their new home and particularly their gardens. These houses are not needed to achieve the targets we may have to deliver in local plan part two. So it may be a designate, designated site within the plan, but it is not a suitable site. You could grant permission to build this de development, but you should ask yourselves, should you grant permission? If you honestly believe that the noise and smell created by having several hundred cattle within a few metres of your garden will not be a potential nuisance, 
then all, by all means, follow the officer's recommendation. If, the, if this development, however, does go ahead, what will happen six months after it is occupied when the new owners start to complain about the noise, the smell and the insects associated with the adjacent farm? There'll be a choice to ignore the complainants or to destroy the farmer's livelihood. So I therefore do urge you to reject this unsuitable recommendation and please do not give approval for this development. It, it's quite clear to me that the inspector's conditions have not been fulfilled, con contrary to the claim made by the first speaker. And this is a disaster waiting to happen for anyone who would be unfortunate enough to, to buy a house Hi. in this development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Edivine. Right, so um, we've heard from the three speakers now, and uh, I don't think I want to repeat what they've said. Um, do you want to respond to any of the points that have been made? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Chair. Um, I won't go into too much detail because a lot of it was already covered um, in the report and um, presentation. I would um, just reiterate the point that the site is allocated in the local plan. It was examined in public and it was approved by the local plan inspector. So we do need to be mindful of that. Um, assessment of noise and odour was undertaken in July. The last most up to date was July 2021. And your environmental health officers have considered those reports and found them acceptable. Um, in terms of concerns about the hedgerow and the buffer strip to the eastern boundary, we do have condition 11 there um, within the, the recommendation, which would um, provide for protection of hedgerow that's to be retained or trees or other features, and also any um, replacement that's required. And I would just go on to further say that in terms of landscaping of that buffer strip, uh, we must remember that landscaping can comprise a variety of measures, um, which could be grass or wildflowers. It doesn't necessarily have to be tree or um, hedges when we talk about landscaping. Um, I think, I think, Chairman, those are all the points that I wanted to just just reiterate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, before I open the debate to the committee, I, I, I sense emotions can be running high. We will try and uh, keep our emotions in check if we can, all of us in the room. Um, I don't want to adjourn the meeting by any means, but um, it, it's a, a forum now for the, the planning committee members to debate, ask questions and get clarification. So I think we're, we're ready to go on this one and, and make a decision. So who wants to start the debate? I see a hand up in the corner there from uh, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Thomas. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've got eight points um, and questions and items of clarification, if I can run through them. Um, I don't, uh, before, before I do that, I don't, um, while I accept the residents' concerns about the number of houses, um, it is an allocated site, site in local plan part two, and um, it is a minimum. And um, the minimum has been exceeded by a considerable greater margin elsewhere than in, in, than in keywords. Um, so the principle of the site, as far as I'm concerned, is um, as set out in local plan part two is acceptable. Um, however, I have got some issues. As far as the um, odour issue is concerned from the farm, um, I think there's, there's no mitigation at all proposed for, for, from the odour. As far as I can see, the um, odour assessment was done before the um, barn, the last barn was built, and the prevailing winds are from the southwest. Um, and what was said in the uh, odour assessment was that the, um, the winds were coming from the east, that, you know, the, the, the farm was at the east and the winds were coming from the southwest, but the third barn is, is more firmly in the direction of the prevailing winds. And I think that is um, certainly worth considering. Um, there were 63 of 127 observations within the site de detected an odour, um, and I think that's significant as well. And the, um, it's downwind of the farm, 55.4% of the year. Um, the other thing about the um, odour is that the sites that had the highest readings on odour uh, in the area of the um, 
play area. So the play area has been put there so that it, there aren't houses there. But the um, play area is the wrong side of the main um, settlement road uh, from the houses to the other side. And the children will be playing in the um, most odorous, as it were, area. So I do have concerns about that. I don't know if the um, officer would like to come back on that, on that in a minute. On the hedges and the south and to the north, I don't really understand why there has to be any loss of hedge um, on either the northern hedge or the south, southern hedge. So perhaps I could come back with that. Um, the ditch on the southern boundary is not protected with a buffer. And um, th there's a statement that there could be access via the, uh, to the field from the south, but it's not just a question of access, and it's not even just a question of policy 19 and the wildlife, that the buildings on that southern ditch, and it is a deep ditch, the buildings are very close to it. So I think there's an issue of land stability there and the suitability of actually building that close to that ditch. Um, there's a, something about the, the protection of the bank in condition 18, but it doesn't mention the bank on the southern um, ditch. It mentions the bank on the eastern ditch. So if this goes forward, I would um, suggest that that is included. The southern ditch is also included in condition 18. Um, the tracking diagram, coming on to the access, the tracking diagram um, shows the um, dustbin lorries, as it were, approaching from their own side of the road. But the, um, the road has got parking for cottages that don't have their own parking spaces. So the lorries would not be approaching on their own side of the road. They'd be in the middle of the road coming past parked cars. So um, I think that's probably fixable, but there have been other comments that the access entrance is not wide enough. Um, I think that perhaps needs looking at. And there's been comments that the bungalows are not nearest any access. Um, so I haven't actually worked out where the bungalows are, but they do need to have good access um, for walking facilities. As far as connectivity is concerned, there is no connection to the southern footpath, which would provide a more convenient wa one walking route into the village facilities. Um, and um, the other thing about connectivity is that the road down the right-hand side doesn't connect up. There's, it stops up in between plot 71 and 72. Um, so, you know, all the cars are going to have to go around the outside. It could just as easily have connected up so that the cars could go up that road. Uh, but what actually does really needs to happen is pedestrian access across between plot 71 and 72. This has happened in lots of estates in our area that they put these strips in to prevent cars going across. And, the, 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 you know, the, the postman basically has to walk all the way around. Um, so a pedestrian access would be needed there. And the final point is that there are no hedgehog highways um, included in your plans. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. As you say, quite a, quite a long list there. Hopefully others won't uh, ask the same questions. But uh, whilst the officer takes a few seconds to think about them, I think the key ones that you mentioned were the location of the play area and the odour and road safety of children getting to that play area why loss of hedges, ditches on the south boundary and buildings too close to the ditch and banks and condition 18 and tracking diagrams of refuse freighters and the like width of the access road, I think from memory is about 5.5 metres, um, bungalow siting, connection to the southern footpath um, from the south of the site and there's something about the roads not connected to the main road network uh, and hedgehogs. I think that was some of the ones I picked up anyway. Over to uh, the planning officer, Mary. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I will pick up on some of the points. Um, in terms of odour, I can only reiterate that your environmental health officers have assessed those reports and found them acceptable. Um, the play area, my understanding is, was positioned there because that's where the, the buffer strip is and it seemed a sensible position to put it within the, lo the open space. Um, land stability, I was just going to look at that condition, I see no reason why it, why we could not include the, um, the southern ditch within condition 18 if, if it was felt necessary. Um, what else did we talk about? 
Oh, the the highway. The other foot. Oh my goodness sake, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. yeah. So Councillor Thomas was, was talking about the highway that was sort of that runs north to south. As you can see, it becomes private drive halfway through. I, I believe that's to do with the steepness of the site that, that you would want to have that layout so that you're able to, to safely access the site without it becoming a steep um, road straight down, but there would be pedestrian access through there. Um, is that better? Oh, I've clearly been talking too long. Um, Bungalows are the burly house type, which I don't know if we can quite make out on that plan. Are we able to zoom, zoom in a bit? And they're on the eastern side. Um, can you make can you make that out? So they have the plots. Um, but yes, those those. No. Yes, I am. All right, let's put it closer. <laughs> That's, this is where the bungalows are created. Um, I'm just going to look at my colleague and check, is there access to that southern footpath from the development? No, so that does... Ah, uh, because of land ownership issues. Unfortunately, that's outside of our, our control to get through onto the southern part of the site. I think that's everything that I can comment on, Chairman. Unless I've, oh, hedgehogs. We've forgotten hedgehogs. We did, I remember from last committee, we had a condition for hedgehog highways, didn't we, on our site at the depot. If councillors feel strongly about that, um, I'm sure we could um, formulate a condition. Uh, that I, think, would allow I think we should. Hedgehogs are becoming a standard item along with um, electric vehicle charging points, which I guess someone's going to have to imminently be discovered that one. But hedgehogs, yeah. I've got Councillor Jones, I think, next on the list. Councillor Jones. Thank you. I've also got quite a few. Um, if, if I'm understanding this right, the Peebles Hedgehog plan um, it was, it had three other sites and was for four fiscal planning. And this local plan part two sort of trounced that somewhat. that this 600 is now already exceeded and is not needed, this site is not needed for that. Um, so to me, the, the first issue is <coughs> what, what confidence does this give to anybody having a neighbourhood plan? And, and, and secondly, why do we need more dwellings than the 600 which have already been viewed as sufficient for Peebles? That's the first question. Do you want to answer it and then we'll go on? I, I think it would probably be useful if we do, yes. So if we could, we could take that uh, first question, the, the 600 homes built or, or thereabouts, the neighbourhood plan, uh, and why, why more homes? And uh, uh, it's a fair point, yes. Thank you. So I take your point regarding numbers. Some of those are... Um, that what we call the windfall sites as well. But I think we have to take that step back and no matter what we might consider at the moment, we have got an allocated site and that, that really does have to be our starting point if it's allocated um, in the local plan and cannot be now revoked. That's, that's, that's not the same as it having to be built on though, is it? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but the principle's been established. Yeah, I understand the plan. principle. So oh, could, I, could, I, could I just interrupt? I'm getting indications from the public that they can't hear, and I, I'm not sure what, if we can uh, look, look at the uh, microphones. It's either bring the microphone nearer to the speaker or, uh, or try and speak up more if you can. I guess we're pretty much full on, are we, on volume? We'll try and uh, speak nearer to the, the microphone for the benefit of the public. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I noticed that the Seven Trent report said that there's a sewer running through the site and that they needed to have a discussion about it. 
can you clarify that presumably that takes sewage from Keyworth to the treatment plant? Can you clarify where it runs and what accounts for paying of that? Yeah. We'll come back to that one. That's a seven okay. tre alleged seven trench sewer running through the site, the point you're making there. Then I'm going to come back to the subject of odour and flies. Odour and flies, okay. Right. Hillside Farm, being a livestock farm, and it, the report actually says it was a muck heap at least 150 yards from the proposed dwelling, so it's clearly expanded the number of um, indoor cattle housing things. And it's somewhere along the line, it's stated to have an odour management plan. And I mean, I know farmers and cows from personal experience. And in winter, that cows and silage stink, plan or no plan, unless they've been fitted with nappies. Um, and flies abound from there, from them, well over 200 metres away. And I know that from many years of personal experience. Um, I notice there's no mention in the report of flies and the ability of prospective residents to enjoy the amenity of their area um, other than a three metre hedge and a three metre fence and a, I can't remember what the area it was, uh, and, and ventilation measures on, uh, uh, to the properties alongside there, which is obviously no good if you want to enjoy your garden. Um, so, can we take that question? Okay. You can do about flies. But You're almost no, echoing what Councillor Thomas said, didn't she? No she asked it. what are the mitigations. Yeah, but I'm also saying I know that, that, that that's a serious issue. Um, but I would, I, would, I would comment about the older management plan because the, the executive summary says the risk of older effects is medium from both sources. And then later on it says, calculated them from negligible, neg negligible to slightly adverse and then later on the, the report says it's not significant so there's three different statements within that report I think that report is rubbish and I'm disgusted our environmental health people have accepted it during all 10 visits it said uh, Across all monitoring stations, they range from zero no odour to five very strong. And, and then in another place from zero to four strong. And I just don't accept the, that our environmental health officers have got it right reading that report. It's rubbish. Seems to be more of a statement than a question, Councillor Jones. Well, yeah, but the, the, the question is about the flies. Flies and the mitigation. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so if I revert back to your question about the Seven Trent sewer, we haven't got the information of where that lies. In any case, it is a matter for, um, if there was an easement on site, the developer would have been required to factor that into their design and layout. So it hasn't been raised, I don't believe, as a, a concern or condition by Seven Trent. And for that reason, it, it probably lies outside of our scope of, of matters to take into account at this stage. Um, take on board your point regarding your thoughts on the report. Um, and as I've explained, I can only rely on, on our environmental health officers for their um, professional advice. In terms of flies, it's probably very difficult to mitigate for flies on the application site. What we do have is conditions on those farms that we approved on the neighbouring site um, regarding their muck heap and muck storage. Um, now I understand there is some um, outstanding information on those, those matters to discharge those conditions and um, it would seem to me that it needs to be pursued with the farmer in terms of um, ensuring that's acceptable with or without housing in the neighbouring site um, to control the, the flies if that is indeed the, um, the issue that we are, are facing. Chairman, I, 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 I just do not accept that. I, flies cannot be deterred from travelling. They do. I mean, we've heard from one of the residents that, that they experienced them on whatever that 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop the giving. I, I think you made the point on flies. Yes. Yes. And in the local plan part two is talking about the immunity of residents should not be significantly affected by noise, odour or dust. It doesn't actually say flies, but it, it's implicit in effects from the neighbouring neighbouring farm. And, and no prejudice or impl implication from the activities yeah. of the farm. Those to me are yeah. key your, issues. Your points are understood. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I, could, I, could no, no, no. I could come up with a motion. I've got Councillor Butler indicated to speak and then Councillor Phillips. Uh, Councillor Butler. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, this, this committee hears lots of applications for new housing, whether it's for 77 or 700 or even several thousand. And uh, each application has to be treated very seriously, which, uh, which it is, this one is today. Um, I have a, just a couple of uh, questions, points of clarification at this stage, and I may well come back later. Now, my first one has been touched on already, but please bear with me. I, uh, it's to do with the neighbourhood plan. Can we just be clear? Because we're talking about the neighbourhood plan, which was led and agreed by parish council and residents of Keyworth uh, some time ago, and they even voted on it. And then we talk about our own uh, local plan, part two. Now, in the neighbourhood plan, can we clarify, was this site uh, in, in the neighbourhood plan or not? I just need to be clear on that. This is the plan that's produced or led by the village, by the community. So that's the first point, question. Um, and, and then the, the next uh, one is in the report with regards to highways, uh, it refers to traffic mitigation, which we're very familiar with on applications like this. But one of the mitigation uh, points, it refers to the junction with um, at, on the Loughborough Road, on the A60 and Pembroke Lane, where it refers to uh, mini roundabout. Now, it almost, uh, correct, well, I'm sure you will correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost implies uh, in this report that if, uh, if permission wasn't granted for this today, then uh, there would, would not be a mini roundabout or junction improvements made there. But again, correct me if I'm wrong, but am I not right in remembering or thinking that this, that, that roundabout has been approved and agreed anyway as a result of the existing development across the road on Bunny Road, which is being built at the moment. So what I'm just saying there is the fact that whatever we do today as a committee for this application, that improvement will take place anyway. I just need to check that. That's what's in my mind. I may be wrong, but I just need to uh, check that. Uh, and then finally, for now, the um, said that uh, 77 much needed homes, and I, I understand why, why the applicant would say that, of course. But again, for clarification, and looking, and, and, and it's in the report, but I just want to check if I've read it correctly. Uh, with the local plan part two as it is at the moment, and the, and the permissions and agreements in place, have we not already met the required number in local uh, in local plan part two already anyway? whether we have this uh, permission granted or not. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. So really three questions there, aren't there, while the uh, planning officer considers them. Um, the first question about the Keyworth Neighbourhood Plan, uh, and did it consider this particular site? And did it, did it approve this site for, for development? And then uh, around the traffic mitigation, the A60, which I think it's probably a trunk road, isn't it, from the national highways? And where, this is a county road. It's a county road, road that links to Pendock Lane at Brad, just out of Bradmore, where right. near the garden centre. You're asking whether the roundabout there has already been financed by the development on the other side of, of Bunny Lane and, and the, um, the 77 homes, local plan part two. Um, do, do we still need, need them? Have we met the target? So the two questions there. Planning officer, if I may. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so in terms of the neighbourhood plan, this came forward in advance of local plan part two. So at the time it came forward, we still, we had a core strategy, but these areas were still in the green belt. So the neighbourhood plan identified sites it preferred. This was not one of them. It preferred certain sites, but it didn't, it didn't allocate sites. And then local plan part two came along Greenbelt land was released and site allocations came forward at that point. Hopefully that just clarifies the chronology of what, what happened. 
um, Councillor Butler's correct in terms of traffic mitigation. This and um, the, the roundabout at the Pendot Lane Junction was agreed through the Bloor's site opposite. The trigger for that is when they reach occupation of 55 dwellings, which from looking at it, I don't think they're, they're too far off. So with or without this application, that will come forward. If this application does come forward, the legal agreement does require a contribution from this site um, towards those improvements to, to, to make that a fair financial contribution. Um, Chairman, I don't know the exact number of new homes in Kewith. I haven't got that information to hand today, I'm afraid. It is probably approaching the, around the, six, the 600 um, because, as we've talked about before and as we've had elsewhere in the borough, sites come forward in advance of our local plan and get permission when we don't have a housing supply. So we, we have got additional sites that were not in that allocation and our numbers are therefore expanding as they have elsewhere particularly as I could speak. So I'll explain to you a little bit more about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, so, can I just so, so, so with regards to point one about the, the, the neighbourhood plan, uh, it, it, it begs a question, what is the point in advising and suggesting to parish councils and villages to put a whole load of work into a neighbourhood plan uh, 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 often at great expense and time and even people go and vote on it and then we come along and, and um, say perhaps, well, you're wrong. Uh, I mean, this, uh, again, it's just my observation. But uh, but thank you. But thank you. Those replies are very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Phillips has indicated. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have paddled over and, and viewed the site uh, up close. And uh, one of the first things that hit me from the roadside was the odour. Um, the, the smells that was, was coming either from the farm, the water treatment plant, or possibly even the field where cattle have been grazing. Um, so one of the questions, I guess, is where do you think those smells are actually coming from? Because if they are coming from the field that's going to be developed, then that smell would go away if this application is approved and those houses are built. So that's one question. Um, I was quite alarmed how close the um, cottages are going to be built up to the farm. Now, knowing cattle, they are very nerdy sort of creatures, and they wouldn't take too kindly to people being so close to them. They get very skittish. So I'm a little bit alarmed about that. The three-metre fence that's proposed uh, as a noise barrier, is it actually just a three-metre fence, or is it actually a proper noise barrier? Because they're, they're two completely different things. Um, the other thing is uh, the barns. We mentioned barns. Are the cattle in the barns 12 months of the year, or is it just over winter? In which case, are they going to get the noise for 12 months of the year from the barns, or just certain times of the year, mainly over winter, when properties would have the windows closed, you would, you would think. So maybe the noise isn't such an issue then. Um, the other thing from the roadside was the way that cars come in along Bunny Lane towards Keyworth. Um, probably in excess of 60 miles an hour, so we need to slow those vehicles down to definite. And regardless whether this application was approved or not, you've got a site across the road. So, And they're coming over the brow of the hill as well. So I'm sure there's, there's plans to sort of uh, reduce the speed there. Um, that's, that's me done, yeah. Thank you. Um, were there any livestock, whatever they were, when in the field when you went there, or was it empty? Um, there was no livestock in the field when I was there. Right, okay. There's quite a few farming questions there, aren't there? I don't know if you're able to answer some Thank of them. Thank you, but Chairman. Got quite technical in terms yeah. of livestock. Clearly, we, have, we don't have any control over the neighbouring farmer and when he puts his cows in his field or in his barns. So, although I appreciate the point you're coming to, I can't give you any, any guarantee over numbers or how those cows will, will use that, that area, I'm afraid. That wouldn't be right for me to try and try and answer that at this point. Um, in terms of speed reduction, that would be a matter for county highways. They haven't advised of any requirement, but they could um, put that forward separately through a traffic regulation order if, if it was necessary. Um, proximity to farm, 
we do we do have the buffer and as you say we do have the um three meter high fence um so there is some setback there and some visual separation um from the farm um the fence yeah not no i don't think we've had a specification for an acoustic fence as no, such um, I was just looking through my conditions chairman to see if that was covered there. I think possibly one of my colleagues might be able to answer that in a we'll, bit more detail. We'll come back on the fence, okay. whether it's an acoustic fence or a traditional timber post boarded fence. But can you? No, I don't think it's an acoustic from when I read it a couple of times, but we'll, we'll do a check on that. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Um, thank you. Um, it was in the very beginning, and I've gone through, people have, have written down questions and thought about them, and they've all been um, answered, but one hasn't. And it was about height of the uh, land and uh, how it affected other housing. And I believe it was said that some of them are quite high, the land rises quite high, that we can see. So I... And it also said that that was taken into account. Well, my question is, how was it taken into account? And what was there any mitigation done to, uh, to address that? Would, would you like the slide, if we can get the slide showing the cross sections? Because yes, I think from memory that gives, if we can, there are um, quite a few sections A, B, A through to B and the like, which I think from memory yeah. may it's help you on that. Simply because it, it was mentioned um, in one of the speakers um, earlier on, and uh, For, about yeah. and that, there, about there, just gone past just, it, that one, yeah, that and, might. and about about the height. I just wondered how it was taken. Not so much on that one, but the, although the bottom one was going I think up. section CC but is what you're interested in. What what they had done to they thought to uh, to help that because some of them will be. As far as I could see, and um, on the plan, be quite high, overlooking um, the others. Well, section AA is certainly, I think, correct me if I'm going from Bunny Lane north to south, broadly speaking, and section CC is going the other way from west to east, broadly speaking. So, you, in AA, the top one, you get an indication of the well, quite significant fall of the land from north to south. Up into the site, and um, section CC gives you a, a, a cross section of the level across the site from the farm to the uh, current development. If that's a help, sorry, excuse me. It was um, purely that some of those looked like three and four story houses, which doesn't help the height that they were. I, I think from I memory, Councillor Mason, two, was it two and a half? So at the top in the middle, yeah. are they, well, three by any means? I know one's in the roof, but they look like three stories. I just wondered how that was mitigating the height, that's all. If, if, we, could get, if we can get clarification, I think Councillor Mason's saying on the top section, section AA, in the middle, there are a group of, oh, it's gone now, houses. <laughs> And you're asking whether those are ground first and second floor or ground first and, and, and accommodation in the roof, I guess. So there are some... There, those in so the So there's middle. some two and a half storey, two storey with accommodation in the roof. There are some full three storey, if you look at section CC, there's a three storey um, there. there. There are significant changes in levels. You're quite right. Um, and on those sections, you can also see existing properties. I don't know how well you can see them on this screen, but they're on on this particular section. They're on the right hand side. And then on the other section, um, if my colleague can um, show us so you can again see where the existing properties on Roselands are and, and then the ditch. Um, the, so there are um, mitigation method, me measures included in the scheme, including retaining walls, um, additional fencing um, to help 
to ensure privacy. Um, in terms of relations with existing properties, officers are, are very satisfied that, that that is acceptable in terms of levels of overlooking and amenity. But clearly, some of the properties within the site do have a, a, a different relationship. Um, that will be plainly evident to those people who are buying those those properties at that time um, as to what their um, outlook and, and garden space will be. Yes, I think section E is of interest to you. That's roughly down the middle of the site from Bunny Lane going south, and you'll see on section E quite a few changes of levels. I just thought it was rather strange to put the higher houses on the higher line. Perhaps it, it I think helps I read in by the, the report fact that it's in mitigation. the middle and further away mm. from the uh, from the edge of the uh, site. Okay, thank you. Councillor Healy, you've indicated to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just just clarification, really. Um, we've been told that the gradient drops from anything up to 14 metres, I believe, and I'm assuming that's from road height. Now, that's quite substantial, and, and the implication of that is at the bottom of that dip, well, have we got a, a potential flooding problem? Uh, has that been considered? What, what uh, has been put in place to, to mitigate any problems? And coming back out of that estate, I'm thinking it's a cold, frosty morning, we've had snow, uh, quite a gradient to come up and try and get onto what is a very busy road, Bunny, Bunny, Bunny Lane on Road Yarra. Um, and I, I believe there was a, a mention of that in the um, late representations, but I'm just wondering how much discussion and concern there is around that, because clearly if traffic are struggling to get out, uh, then the whole estate is, is, is clogged, for want of a better word. So it really is just the one entrance in and out, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, I think from my reading of the report, and I'll pass over to the planning officer, as you say, the gradient is quite significant from north from the lane to south. And I, I guess you're talking about surface water, i.e. rainfall. And I think somewhere in the report, uh, it talks about the attenuation pond, which is bottom left, southwest corner. And then that will discharge intervals into the existing watercourse along the southern boundary. And I think it says in the report, if I'm to be corrected, that there'll be no more discharge at peak than there, there is at the moment. So I hope that's fine enough to be positive. I think you've answered that perfectly, Chairman. Well, well, well. Really <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so they're required to just stick to greenfield runoff rate and not have significantly greater runoff. And as Chairman said, it, it runs naturally down into that corner anyway, which is where the attenuation basin is located. Uh, in terms of gradient, we've been through quite a lot of consultation with the Highways Authority to make sure that is safe and acceptable. It, the gradient is um, not as steep at the top half of the site, the way it's been designed, so that it does help with that top half of the site not being as steep, becomes steeper as you, as you travel down through the site. So it should assist in terms of being able to get safely in and out at the top there. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Just for clarification on the incline, mm. where is the farm and the cattle housing in relation to the prospect of it? Is it higher or lower? Or Sorry, could you repeat that? Where, where is the farm in relation where to Where is the farm, the, not the farm, the, the cattle housing mm -hmm. shed? Yeah, the barns, yeah. Yeah, where, where are they in, in, in relation to those cross sections? Um, well, on the top one section, uh, that's the better. Section CC is probably a best bet, is it not? Because that's west to east. So on the, the third one down, the barns are on the left, I think. I'm getting a nod, yep. yes. So section CC is a cross section from west to east across the proposed site and the barns, the three barns, are to the left of that three-storey townhouse or what you would call it on, on the left of that cross section. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I 
um, I, I'm going to propose as it, having respect to the amount of work that's gone into this, um, particularly from the officer and in this report, uh, I'm going to propose that, that the, um, the, the recommendation be not approved. And I can give you the reasons why. Right, so I, I have a proposal from Councillor Jones that the recommendation is not approved and we'll need to take some time now to uh, ask Councillor Jones for, for some words, if we may, and, and we need to take our time on this to get it right as to your reasons why you're making that proposal, please. Well, I think what I'm saying is the proposals are not consistent with the neighbourhood plan. They are not, con not they're, they're not consistent they're not consistent with the local plan part two in that they are not sympathetic or compatible with the neighbouring farm. I, I, can uh, hear, so we, I can hear a radio or a phone. Sorry, it's distracting me. I don't know where it is. Okay. Uh, are not sympathetic or compatible with the neighbouring farm and sewage treatment works, which would have an unsatisfactory effect in terms of odour and flies on the ability of residents of the proposed dwellings to have reasonable amenity within the curtilage and inside of their properties. Is that the substance of, of your proposal? Um, right, we need to try and, uh, I'm, I'm open to comments. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll try and put those that's words that's together. I'm concluding. Councillor Lodu Horan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to second the proposal from Councillor Jones. Um, I've, I've, I've read a very lengthy report and I'm extremely grateful today for the very eloquent speakers um, and articulate uh, points of view that you've received, particularly from uh, Mrs. Butler. Um, I, I remember Mr. Chairman, you were very uh, persuasive at a previous council meeting uh, when you managed to convince the majority of councillors that we must vote for local plan two. So I do accept that this particular site uh, has, uh, as, a, as a development uh, area has been, has been established. But I suspect I'm not alone in um, going along to various parish council meetings and listening to the debate when there are um, local planning applications uh, put forward and the perception uh, amongst many parishes, and I picked this up over my previous 18 and a half years as a councillor, uh, is that basically Rushcliffe just ignore parishes. You know, we encourage them to get involved and uh, have community-led plans, neighbourhood plans and all of that. And of course, we encourage them to send in comments on planning applications. But the perception out there is that Rushcliffe Borough Council just ignores them. Um, I don't believe that that is our intention as councillors. Um, we, we value very much the, the uh, contribution made by our colleagues on parish councils. And, and I think in this occasion, um, one of the, one of the key, key objectives of the Keyworth Neighbourhood Plan, item uh, point six, housing to deliver 450 to 480 homes in order to meet the housing growth requirement for Keyworth up to 2028, whilst helping to create a sensitively designed and sustainable uh, community. Now, obviously this was drawn up a few years ago, and I think at Local Plan 2, the, um, the, the, the target was, was up towards uh, 600 and of course with, if, we, if we pass this particular application then we're heading towards uh, 700 and that's a considerable um, increase 
on what uh, the keyword parish council and others were, were considering a few years ago. And we have to be sensitive, um, I think, to um, uh, you know, local opinion. And I think local opinion matters. After all, uh, one of our Rushcliffe MPs recently, who happened to be the Secretary of State at the time, was sacked. Partly because um, the uh, perception was that um, councils are being encouraged to just simply build and build and build. Mr Chairman, I've, I'm not an expert and I don't believe that the developer has any obligation to, you know, absolutely follow the guidelines that uh, uh, the local plan or the neighbourhood plan um, assumes. It's not, it's not the developer's responsibility. But it is our responsibility, it is this committee's responsibility to take into account um, the views of our colleagues locally and also the local plan that we have adopted. It is my, it is my thoughts that the illustration that I see before me is probably over intensive on the you know, existing um, residential area, certainly in one part of the site. And so I, I myself, Mr. Mr. Chairman, would like to add that the development is over, over intensive and overbearing uh, on existing properties. If that could be added to the proposal with um, Councillor Jones Green. Thank you, uh, Councillor. So you're, you're seconding and you're requesting adding on some words about over intensive and over development while we're considering adding those on and bringing them back to Councillor Jones for his approval or otherwise. I, I, sorry, I missed Councillor Thomas was indicating that she wished to speak, so that might be a good opportunity. Oh, I was indicating originally to um, second the um, proposal from Councillor Jones, but um, having heard um, the, the reasons and the additional reasons from Councillor and I'm not quite so sure now. I think the reason for rejecting this site is the odour from the farm and the, um, the impact from the farm. That is the reason. And as far as I'm concerned, there, there are other issues, but they could be resolved. That is the only issue um, for me. Um, the um, intensity in terms of the size of the plot and the um, number of dwellings is certainly no worse than elsewhere. Um, and as far as the neighbourhood plan is concerned, the neighbourhood plan predates local plan part two. So if we're concerned about trashing the keyword neighbourhood plan, actually, sorry, we've already done that. We did that when we voted for local plan part two. So my, my proposal would be, um, you know, my suggestion would be that we um, refuse this application on one ground, and that is the um, odour um, from the, uh, and other associated effects from the farm. Um, the neighbourhood plan is a red herring, and the density of the dwellings is acceptable on a site that size. Thank you. Thank you. I understand another point from you. I've got Andrew. What? Well, well, in fairness, can't, um, I've got Andrew Ashcroft, and I think first, and then Councillor Jones. Andrew, Andrew Ashcroft, you can proceed. Chair, would it be helpful if I give you some advice after all the members have commented? I mean, indeed, you've got a comprehensive series of issues that members okay. might be minded not to go along with the recommendation with, and I can comment on that point. Thank you. So it's back to Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, you, you've had Councillor Thomas and Councillor Perdue Horan offering additions to your um, motion, um, which we'll take the faith. Yeah, over I'm, there and over development and, and odour. Um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry to disappoint Councillor Pudd, you horror, but uh, I, I've not heard any evidence that it's, it's it, I mean, I know it's more houses than it's dirty, dirt, dirty, whatever, so it's, it feels slightly tighter, but I don't think that's sufficient grounds for rejecting this application, and I stick by what I said, really. So you're aligning yourself with Councillor Thomas on rejecting the overdevelopment, over, overbearing. What about the odour from Councillor Thomas? Well, I, it, that was in my, uh, yeah. It was yeah, in yours, yeah, right. Yeah, the unsatisfactory in terms of odour and fly on the ability of residents. Yeah. 
we're almost there on a firm of words, Councillor Jones. Can you just clarify, if, if you can, well, what, what part of the neighbourhood plan you, you, you're actually concerned about? Well, my understanding is the, the neighbourhood plan allocated Black Lane, Nicker Hill and North of Bunny Lane and, and rejected this site as unsatisfactory. Um, so, it, 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 uh, although it's been superseded by the local plan part two, it, 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 it does stand. The proposals are not consistent with the neighbourhood plan, but they're not consistent with lo local plan part two in that they're not effectively compatible with a, an adjoining farm, cattle farm. I think we got a little bit technical, certainly for me. I'm going to ask Andrew Ashcroft if he could sum up on, on that area about the neighbourhood plan and its um, association with the local plan part two, please, Andrew. Thank you. Chair, sure. thank you. Um, and I'm heartened by the level and the nature and the detail of the discussion that members have just had. Um, Chair, you would be pleased to know that it's not my role to tell members what you should and shouldn't do, because plainly this is the whole purpose of a meeting of this nature, to discuss controversial planning applications. But the part of my role is to give you advice on the potential implications of you deciding to refuse the application on the various issues that are identified. In these circumstances, members, it's always useful to go back to basics. And the basics of the planning system is that it's plan-led. And therefore, in order to understand the system, you need to understand what the development plan is, because the planning system requires that decisions must be in accordance with the development plan unless material planning considerations indicate otherwise. So there's two strands to this. What is the development plan? And in this case, what you give greatest weight to in the development plan and the other material planning considerations. And plenty of different members are taking different views on the nature and the status of the development plan. And um, for clarity here, your development plan is both the local plan and the neighbourhood. Um, the neighbourhood plan was quite clear. The neighbourhood plan was made in June 2019. Local plan part two was adopted in, uh, sorry, the neighbourhood plan was made in 2018. The local plan was adopted in 2019. Um, the neighbourhood plan was quite clear that it identified preferences, but it didn't allocate sites. It couldn't do so because it's only the role of a local plan to release sites from the green belt. That's why the neighbourhood plan took that approach. Para 10.5 of the Neighbourhood Plan is quite critical to this debate, uh, where it says, it is, however, recognised that it will be the role of Local Plan Part 2 ultimately to determine the overall level of residential development on greenfield sites adjacent to the existing built-up area of the village, in which direction around the village development is focused and which specific sites are allocated for uh, new development coming forward. That's what Local Plan Part 2 did. And clearly members have had the debate about that plan being adopted by council. And plenty of different members will have had different views uh, on that matter. We find ourselves here in the circumstances where different elements of the development plan pull in different ways. Um, but the legislation is clear that where this is the case, um, that conflict um, it must, must be resolved in favour of the policy which is contained in the last document to become part of the development plan. So here, in development plan terms, uh, you must give greatest and significant weight to the allocation of this site in your local plan part two. Um, there's also a subtext here that plainly members are expected to determine applications in accordance with national policy. And the National Planning Policy Framework is being continually updated. It was updated in 2019, and it was updated in July of this year. And again, each time the government is stressing the importance of delivering new houses. And, and, and plainly, a lot of the local plan part two was about the minimum delivery of houses. And plainly, whatever development has come forward in the village since the adoption of the local plan, that additional development doesn't then force this council to deallocate that site. Um, so with those comments in mind, um, it would be my advice to you that to attempt to refuse the application on simple policy grounds would probably be unreasonable. You have a very clear planning policy context here. And within that context, unless there are other material considerations, um, that should be your direction of travel. You've heard the presentation earlier about how this scheme uh, 
complies with the four criteria within that policy. And you can make your own judgment on that um, about the weight and the significance that you give to that. If you then start to look at the very detailed issues that members have raised, um, clearly those are all material planning considerations, and it's appropriate that you consider them. Um, it's also appropriate that you give appropriate weight to them. And in giving weight to them, you base that weight on evidence. Plainly, we all have views about different things, but you've heard in terms of the presentation and answers to questions, um, detailed studies have been carried out principally on ODA. They've been consulted with your technical officers, and your technical officers are comfortable with that. So again, members need to be careful that they have the evidence to be able to substantiate the reason for refusal uh, on those grounds. Um, in terms of the over-intensive um, nature of the development and levels, um, we've tried to explain to you, and you've seen some of the levels, you'll form your own judgments on those. Uh, as we showed earlier, certainly level EE is probably the critical level. Um, and we've tried honestly and openly to demonstrate to you what the impact of that is. It's on that issue that we would ask you to make your own judgment. Um, Plainly, you as members are entitled to judgment. You've heard what local residents have said, and you'll give appropriate weight to that. In, in, in doing so, on the one hand, you need to recognise that individual people will come to their own judgments about whether they want to buy some of those houses that are most affected by the cross-section on EE. Um, plainly, on the other hand, um, we have a broader responsibility to make sure that new development is to the highest possible standards. And in, meet, in, and in that sense, meets the more general policies in local plan part two. So, Chairman, if I try to summarise that, um, plainly members have focused on several key um, material considerations. I would invite members to, one necessary, test those with officers and see whether there would be actual evidence to substantiate those material considerations as reasons for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. If only for my own um, knowledge, could you give an opinion or advice on the uh, policy 19, I think it is, that the, the 10 metre rule and the watercourses, stroke ditch, stroke streams, or whatever we want to call them, if you could just give us some clarification on your thoughts on, on re the relevance of local plan part two, policy 19, and the 10 metre strip for maintenance and biodiversity and all the rest of that, I'd be grateful. Chairman, and again, you need to look at that within the round. Uh, and you've heard the advice that officers have given to you about the nature of the ditch and how it relates to the advice that was concluded within the local plan. Uh, you'll, you'll, again, you'll see the advice that was received from the Secretary Consultees on this matter. Um, plainly, policy 19 is one of the policies within the plan. Inevitably, what happens over time is that developers come forward with their schemes and they attempt, were practical, to come forward with proposals that meet those um, policies and guidance. But in certain circumstances, and this may be one, um, there may be circumstances where a development can depart slightly from that. Um, plainly here, I think we have this overlapping issue of planning policy against land ownership and other issues that relate to the scale and the nature of ditch. Um, so, Chairman, I think we as officers have tried to look at that in the round and on the balance of the evidence, think that it's an appropriate and acceptable way forward. Thank you. Right. It takes us back now to the wording of Councillor Jones's proposed motion, I think. Mm, yeah, well, I, I, I listened to the advice with great interest. And I've obviously read the report and read a lot of the documents behind the report. Um, so it, it, it does make sense, given what's been said, not to refer to the neighbourhood plan, but simply to say that the proposals are not consistent with the local plan part two, whatever it says in paragraph 43, policy 4.4, the allocated the site subject to certain criteria. It doesn't mention flies, can't mention in flies, but it does mention noise, odour and dust from the neighbouring site. And that there are no prejudicial implications either way. So, so I, I remain of the view, uh, <clears throat> and I, I've already said why I, I, I question seriously the um, integrity of the ODA management report submitted by the developer. Um, I, I 
so I, I remain of the view that the proposal is not consistent with the local plan part two in that they are not sympathetic or compatible with the neighbouring farm um, and sewage treatment works which would have an unsatisfactory effect in terms of odour of flies and the ability of residents of the proposed dwelling to have reasonable amenity within the curtilage of and inside their properties. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perdue Horan, are you content, as they say, with what Councillor Jones just said as a seconder? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, uh, for clarification, um, uh, myself and Councillor Jones have not discussed this item prior to this meeting. So it's inevitable when we get to difficult uh, decisions that uh, there may be a difference of opinion or, or, or approach from individual members' thoughts. So I fully accept Councillor Jones uh, is perfectly entitled to choose whichever second uh, he wishes to choose. Councillor Thomas. Um, I, I don't know if it's helpful to, uh, to propose adding this, um, but policy 4.4 of local plan part two, uh, part A, requires um, the development will be subject to the following requirements. And part A is the amenity of residents who cannot be significantly affected by no noise, odour or dust resulting from the activities of the neighbouring farm. So my suggestion would be that policy 4.4A is contravened by this application. Thank you. Right, I think we need to draw a line here and get some words put that we can agree on. Yes, um, and then we'll, we'll take a vote. Yeah, I um, yep. So I'm clear now on on Councillor Jones' um, motion, which is to refuse planning permission on on the basis of the proposal being contrary to Policy Four Point Four Part A, not being adequately demonstrated that the effects of noise, odour, dust, and flies resulting from the neighbouring farm would would not be there at the end of it, but it would impact on yeah then the impact on the uh, reasonable enjoyment of their properties by the new residents so words yeah oh, sorry yes i've written down sewage farm so we are saying it's not been adequately demonstrated that there would be Adequate, mit yeah, adequate mitigation. I'm going to write this down That's as I right. speak, Chairman. Oh, no, we need to get it right. Take your time. Give me a moment. Yep, and I'll give you a moment. Okay. It's um, quite technical, isn't it, part of the uh, the referencing back to the local plan and the various policies and subsections. Do it again. For the benefit of uh, Councillor Jones and Councillor Perdue Horan. To if you could take it from the top. Uh, so I, I would suggest words to the effect of it has not been adequately demonstrated as adequate mitigation for the odour, noise, dust and flies created by the neighbouring farm and sewage plant. This would result in an unsatisfactory level of amenity for occupiers of new plots um, and this would be contrary to policy 4.4 of local plan part 2 criteria A. Does that cover everything? We could turn to that, Councillor Jones? Yes, right. I think that brings us to the point of a vote. And I think we have a valid motion and we have a proposal and seconder. Uh, I therefore propose we take a vote on this motion, which is to refuse planning permission on the grounds that you've just had read out to you. So if I could ask uh, Mr. Sells to conduct the vote, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. All those in favour of the motion? Shall I do it? 
So all those in, in favour, and in favour is to refuse time permission. Can you raise your hands, please? That's 11 chairs, that's unanimous. That's a, a unanimous decision to refuse planning permission. So um, that is the end of the debate, I believe. And uh, thank you for that. I'm minded of the time, and I thank the speakers for their contribution uh, and those in the debate. I'm minded of the time. I, I'm leaving with the other county councillors. It may be opportune to take a 10 minute comfort break uh, now, I think, because we've got two more items to go. So I'll vacate the chair. It's about quarter past four by my watch. If you could be back here by 25 past four, I'd be grateful. Thank you.
Thank you, councillors. We, uh, we will begin again. Um, the next application is a county one. It's for the erection of a 120-place temporary school learning village accommodation with temporary lit access road and permanent lit access path with associated areas of soft play, canopies, car parking and surface water balancing pond. The officer for this application is Mr. Cook. If you go to your... Uh... Thank you, Chairman. Just to clarify, it's uh, Mr. Taylor driving you through this one. Quite all right. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, members are advised that there have been late representations received for this application. Mm. I'm mindful at the start of the first item we just debated, members indicated that they had read the late rep, so I will take it that they read them in their entirety and not just in relation to the first item. But just by way of a quick pre through them for the, uh, for the benefit of those who may be watching online, uh, we just waiting for the presentation to catch up, Chairman. Apologies. Sorry about that, Chairman. Just checking that the world outside this room can view the items we're discussing this afternoon. Um, as I was saying, uh, late reps have been received. Uh, members have indicated that they have read them, but for the benefit of those viewing out online or watching this later, should they choose to do so, late reps have been received from the three ward councils within East Leek who have raised a number of issues uh, primarily relating to highways matters and landscaping, but not exclusively. Officers have sought to address those within the late representation and are proposing two additional conditions for members' consideration this afternoon, conditions 13 and 14. Um, there is also a proposed revision to the wording of condition 4 uh, with relation to the proposed landscaping scheme to require details of restoration for any trees that were lost, would be lost if the proposal were allowed to go ahead. And again, I will cover that when I take members through the item shortly. Uh, there's also the suggestion of including uh, an additional form of words within the suggested informative note about rights of way and a revision to condition one so that uh, the playing fields can be constructed utilising the proposed temporary road. Um, other updates within the report are a proposed revision to the, sorry, a correction to the wording of condition six, which refers to the recently updated NPPF. Apologies on my part, the previous version was referred, i.e. the February 29 version, when it should be the most recent 2021 version. Uh, also clarification uh, regarding consultee comments from colleagues in environmental health. They were re received uh, on the cusp of drafting the final report. Um, initially, I drafted it on the basis they hadn't been received. They were arrived at the 11th hour, and I have neglected to remove the sentence that said comments hadn't been received. The comments are within the body of the report, and they're covered at paragraphs 21, 47, and 48. So again, apologies on my part for that. And finally, um, colleagues in environmental sustainability, the environmental sustainability officer commented, stating that they'd only received a redacted version of the ecological reports. That is common practice. Uh, so that the locations of potentially protected species aren't divulged to the wider community or indeed the wider world. Uh, comments of unredacted documents have been shared with colleagues in the environmental sustainability team as late as yesterday afternoon. So I 
again, by way of a verbal update in addition to this written report. Um, there are some, some suggested further conditions, and I have also been advised that colleagues at the County Council have also um, suggested conditions to the case officer looking to determine the application. The final point on the updates, Chairman, is again an error on my part. I should have known better. I've misspelt the words Kirk Lee. It's actually the words Lee within the update report. So again, apologies on my part. I am human. Um, have the first slide up, please, Mr. Cook. So, um, as members uh, will probably remember, back in June this year, you were asked to comment on a proposal for a permanent primary school within the village of East Leek. Um, this proposal is a county application for a new temporary primary school, whilst a permanent school is being constructed. Uh, as it's a county application, the Borough Council members here before us this afternoon advised that we're only a consultee on this application and that the County Council is a determining authority. So just for clarity, we cannot determine the application. We are merely being asked for our views on it. It's up to the County Council to determine the outcome of the application. Uh, the plan on the screen before you, unfortunately, was submitted the application and is slightly out of date in terms of the aerial photography. Um, East Leak has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, as the next image will clarify, uh, if you just take note of where the red line is, um, there's been quite a bit of development taking place. This is the most recent Google image I was able to obtain uh, this morning. So it shows the persimmon development to the left-hand side um, of the, you'll see sort of a small undeveloped area of land where that red line was indicated in the top right-hand corner. And the ongoing development of the David Wilson homes immediately south of that, that site. Um, Submission is a full application for a 120 place temporary school with a temporary access road and a permanent access path, along with areas of soft play, canopies, car parking and associated infrastructure. The educational need for the pupils is required from next September, so that's September 2022, by which time the permanent school is expected to be under construction, but it's not anticipated to be completed until September 2023. Clearly, that leaves a 12-month gap where there is educational need, but the permanent school would not be open and available for use, hence the application for the temporary school before you this afternoon. Um, so in the interim period, uh, that demand is proposed to met for 122 pupils through this application before you for your comments and consideration. The development will be located alongside the two residential developments on your screen uh, in front of you now. Uh, they are the Persimmon Development off Kirkley Road, located to the west, and the David Wilson Homes off Renston Road to the south. The site is currently an arable field separating from David Wilson Homes by a belt of woodland planting. Uh, and to the north of the site is the Sheep Wash Brook, which you can just about make out sort of a meandering line uh, along which the brook follows that tree planted area. Plans have been submitted showing where the school would be located, along with a temporary access road and other infrastructure measures. Public access to the temporary school site from the David Wilson Homes development would be restricted until around 2023 as it is a live building site, as you'll have seen from the aerial photography. Public access from that site will be determined by a house builder's build-out rate and to a certain extent the market. Uh, and subsequently the availability of safe access cannot be guaranteed through that site at this time. Nottingham County Council needs that certainty uh, that places will be available from 2022 to meet its statutory duty and that there will be a safe form of access. Therefore, Public access to the temporary school is proposed by a new road as an extension to Sheep Wash Way within the Persimmon development. The vehicular road is proposed to be a temporary measure to be used by the construction traffic for constructing and dismantling the temporary school and also to allow access for staff, services, post, deliveries, things of that sort of nature, and emergency vehicles only during the, the use for the temporary school. The new road would not be available to parents or gardens to you, guardians to use or for the general public to be able to access. The proposed buildings would be located to the east of the public right of way, which you'll see on the plan before you run broadly north, north south through the middle of the screen. Um, and the, the site comprises, if I work around in a broadly clockwise manner from sort of the top of the proposed buildings, which is brown rectangles and squares on the plan. So at the top, you've got a dining room slash hall area for assemblies school plays, things of that sort of nature, with a kitchen attached with an appropriate store, storage facilities. Moving around clockwise, you've then got what's proposed to be the nursery reception area, 
and you'll see sort of two sort of lightly shaded blue areas to the side of that, which are supposed to be sun canopy areas with sort of soft rubber crumb areas beneath that. The green indication is a turf clay area. The three broadly square squares at the bottom of the screen are three separate classrooms. You've then got the grey area indicated to be the staff car park. And then immediately north of that, you've got the administration block, which would include things like the head teacher's office, staff room, and various office buildings for the day-to-day -day running of the school. You've then got the, the grey road that runs broadly east-west across the screen, connecting to the T-junction at the end of Sheepwash Way. Uh, the brown line running parallel to that beneath it is the footway, which is um, close to completion. It's under construction, and you'll see that in some photographs shortly when I guide members through that. Um, the buildings on site are single storey. They would be predominantly flat roof structures with a height of around 2.9 metres. However, the structures would be elevated slightly above ground level due to the fall in land. The maximum height above ground level would be 3.3 metres. The structures form a concise group of buildings and seek to reduce the impact on the neighbouring development and to create a courtyard feeling for the school. Uh, members are advised that none of the ward members or the parish council or the technical consultees have objected to the proposal subject to conditions being considered to be attached to any recommendation. However, the scheme is before members due to the borough council scheme of delegation requiring members consideration for submission. Site currently benefits from outline planning permission for an educational use by virtue of the 2016 permission for the David Wilson housing development and by the more recent outline application for the permanent school. Uh, that was determined by the County Council earlier this year. Therefore, officers are satisfied with the principle of a new school on this site. As set out in the agenda papers, officers are also satisfied that the school is suitably designed and located to have an acceptable relationship to the neighbouring residential properties. Matters of highway safety, flood risk, contamination, noise, ecology, landscaping and archaeology are also set out in the papers. Members are advised that the issues of parents or guardian parking Picking up and drop off congestion and general highway safety matters are matters for further comment by the highway authority as technical experts in their assessment of the proposal. Furthermore, as the determining authority, these are matters for the county council to consider in consultation with the, the highway authority. Nevertheless, members can, through this current process, make the county council aware of any such concerns they may have with the proposal documents. If I can now take you through some photographs to give you a flavour of what the area looks like. So this is looking along cheap wash way towards where the proposed access road would be formed and I'd ask members to take, take note of the, the parking situation in this particular street. You'll notice that it's frontage driveways um, leading onto uh, the newly, relatively newly tarmac highway. Next photograph we've stepped forward several paces towards the T junction at the end there and you'll notice there's some site fencing up beyond which the pedestrian access is nearing completion but doesn't appear to be open to the general public. I presume it's waiting for a final seal or surface on the, on the, on the, the, the bound thing that's going there. Um, again, stepping onto the edge of that surface, uh, the proposed highway, the new temporary access would be to the left-hand side of this image. And you'll notice that it's got a cross, a, a drainage feature. And I'd also ask members to note that there are um, landscaping that's gone in as part of this recent housing development in the way. Uh, at the back of the image, you'll notice there's a mature woodland copse at the end of the path. Um, the, the school buildings are proposed to the left-hand side of that. And again, as we move further along this track, we'll just take a look right up in towards the David Wilson development. So that's looking up the public right-of-way that runs through the site up towards the David Wilson development. We'll then turn 90 degrees to our right, looking back to where we've come from. And you get an indication of where that roadway comes parallel to this, this footpath. We turn right again and we look down the public right of way with the school buildings proposed on the right hand side just behind the woodland copse that's to our immediate right. Stepping forward again we get a clearer view of where the proposed school buildings um, are proposed to be and then we step slightly further forward turn 180 degrees and look back at that woodland copse so again the school buildings would be in the immediate foreground of this image. Again, if I can guide members just through a couple of plans, the red line plan uh, on the screen shows the, the sort of the, the leg running out towards the left hand side of the image is where the proposed access road would be, and the triangular portion is the, the fenced area within which the school buildings are proposed to be located. Uh, a 
again, this plan shows the relative topography of the site. It is a sloping site, um, and that's why there would be differences between the, the heights of the buildings um, and the, the platforms would on which they would propose to be constructed. Um, again, we have the layout plan. I've talked through members earlier, just as a reference to see where the right of way, where she wash way is, um, and where the, the footpath runs through the site. Uh, this is just a, a zoomed in version of the proposed buildings to give an indication of the uses and the internal layouts. We then have some elevations of the proposed buildings, again showing them to be flat roof and up to 2.9 metres in height, but raised to 3.3 .3, depending on the, the platforms they've got to sit on relative to the topography. Uh, there's some sections through the site, again showing that, 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 that fall in the land as you move from south to north along the footpath. Final plan is submitted shows the proposed restoration. So, after the school use, temporary school use is no longer required. This shows what the applicants would propose to do in terms of removing the temporary road and restoring the land back to um, its approved position to be the playing fields for the permanent school. Therefore, officers are recommending that members respond to the county council advising that the borough council does not object. Sub to, to the proposal subject to conditions and informative notes set out in the agenda papers, including the revisions in the late reps and any other conditions that the County Council consider appropriate. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for that presentation. We have one speaker um, for this, which is um, Councillor Wade. I'm sure you're familiar with the timings and Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I need to say that the, the ward members are 100% behind the new school and the temporary arrangements for pupils starting September 22. The reason for our comments is to try to ensure that the process goes as smoothly as possible and to try to avoid conflicts arising between the local residents, particularly those living on Sheepwash Way, people dropping off their children at school and construction work. Some of these comments and concerns come from a public meeting held in East Leap on the 12th of October. Um, the ward members thank the planning officers for their help in clarifying a number of the issues that we have raised. <coughs> so the main two concerns now are the access and road safety issues. Um, people driving to the school will need to drop off and pick up at the end of Sheepwash Way, the hammerhead that um, you saw in the pictures. This has potential to cause chaos and lead to gridlock. There's little turning space if cars are queuing along the approach road. This is a great concern amongst local residents. A one-way system of turning circle is needed and we urge the highways, the applicant and constructors to work together to develop a suitable scheme. The current plan will make it impossible for parents to be able to stop for those all-important quick chats with teachers at the start and end of the school day. Good design here will go a long way to alleviate most of the problems. The hope is that the majority of children will arrive on foot and not by car. The assumption seems to be that this school is only for children from the David Wilson and Persimmon estates. However, the Spencer Academy Trust maintain that the catchment area is the whole of East Leap. This could mean that some children could be travelling considerable distance, so some car use is inevitable. To access Sheep Wash Way, pedestrians and vehicles from outside the Meadowcroft estate will need to negotiate a roundabout at the junction of Woodgate Road, Sheep Wash Way, Kirkland and Brookside. I realise that this is not within the planning application, but this may be our only opportunity to raise this issue. It will be a significant part of access to the school and maybe has been omitted because the possibility of children coming from further afield has largely been ignored. Speed of traffic, particularly from Woodgate Road, continues to cause concern for residents. Visibility for people crossing any of the junctions, but particularly Kirkley Road, is compromised by the signage on the roundabout. This has been reported to highways, but as there have been no deaths or serious accidents, they feel additional measures are not needed. Statistics on the road and footpath use in this area are based on historical data and do not take into account the considerable changes that will arise from the opening of the new school, starting with 120 pupils and increasing to 420 
when the permanent school opens. Measures need to be taken now in order to avoid having to look back on any tragedy and then make changes when it's too late. Kirkley Road is one of the crossing points that is likely to see more pedestrians when the school opens. It's the main walking route from areas off Woodgate Road. There's no footpath between Sheepwash Way and to the eastern side of Brookside. Pedestrians are forced to cross two other roads to access the footpath on the west side of Brookside and this is the route that takes them into the village. Consideration should be given to school zone measures such as zigzags, timed illuminated signs and crossing patrols. The installation of a 20 mile an hour zone will help with making this a safer area. I hope that measures can be put in place to ensure the security of our children. We should never compromise on the safety of our children. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we now move to Steve Casale with the entrepreneurial matter. Just, just to clarify, Chairman, if I may, um, obviously members are not in the benefit of having knowledge of what the hiring authority's views are in respect to the proposal. That said, we have the ability to make the determining authority aware of any concerns we have. Uh, what I would say is in the late rep, there are two additional suggested conditions. There's conditions 13 and 14. Condition 13 relates to the proposal for a school zone, um, looking at revisions to um, or assessment of the signage in relation to the roundabout on Kirtley Road and other matters. So hopefully that will go some way to satisfying one of Council Way's concerns, which is expressed with us. The other is condition 14, which talks about measures to prevent errant parking and the vehicle turning in the vehicle turning head at the end of Sheep Wash Way. Um, these are conditions that the County Council did impose on the permanent school when they determined that earlier this year. So it wouldn't seem unreasonable for them to consider them as part of the current proposal, but I can't guarantee that they will because we're not the determining authority. Thank you. Um, it's, it's like uh, every time a school is either built or we're talking about any school, it seems to be that it's parking and access to it, uh, no matter where it is, no matter how many houses are. And I sincerely hope that this is in somehow mitigated um, in the reply that we give to them. Um, from what uh, the officer has said, I believe that could happen, and I, I hope I hope that it does. But I would like to uh, move the recommendation um, that uh, the borough council does not object to the proposal, um, subject to the recommended conditions, particularly as regards safety, parking, access, um, and remembering that there's young children actually uh, trying to get there, <laughs> trying to get there, as well as cars. Um, so, yes, I, I, would, um, I would like to support the uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jones, you indicated. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm minded to, to second that, but I just want to be clear on which conditions we're agreeing, because there's some that are numbered in the additional papers and, and there's some that are still in the report so I just want to be clear w which are which uh, so, so that we're not losing anything um, and yeah I, I tell the, the I tell the SD that's been raised but yeah seems to be covering that about you know a, a, a parking issue and, and how that is if it helps, Councillor Jones, I, I was going to seek the same clarification from Councillor Mason, but it is the recommendation within the report subject to the revisions within the late reps um, to clarify and address and include those additional conditions regarding the highway measures proposed. Yeah, so, so the, the numbers in the additional papers re re replace some of those, but they're still in the, that still stand. Correct. There are some suggested revisions to the existing wording within the initial agenda papers, but, the others but there's also some additional conditions proposed uh, over and above those. Thank that you. would be the, the culmination of those two. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Second. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. And I'd just like to um, echo Councillor Way's um, thanks to the officers for the um, um, conversations that we've had on this, which is, have been positive. But there are two main issues, really. And it's in a matter of, I can't tell you, it's a matter of huge concern to the residents on Sheepwash Way um, that, you know, all of a sudden there will be all these cars coming down and trying to turn at that bottom uh, where there is nowhere to turn. And um, you saw from the slides, actually, that they park cars on that handhead. Um, and so those cars will be displaced onto Sheepwash Way, so there'll be even more parking on Sheepwash Way. I think the um, conditions and the, all the wording have covered all this, but I would just suggest, please, that we send it with a covering note to the County Council, highlighting these two big issues, really. The first is that the drop-off and pick-off needs a practical arrangement, having regard to the residents, and to urge highways and the applicants to get together to actually look at that. Um, and the second is the safety at the roundabout at the bottom of Kirkby. Uh, with the additional and changed use on this, it really needs to be looked at so that those children can walk to school. Um, so I would suggest a covering note um, covering those things. The other thing I'd just say, um, you know, to back up what Councillor Way said, is that the, there, are three, there will be three primary schools in the village, each of which has a catchment area. This school's catchment area will be the whole of the parish. And so it's not going to be just taking children from the, from the immediate area. It's going to be taking children from all the extremities of the, of, the, of the parish who can't get into their local catchment school. And so it's, it's almost inevitable, particularly at first, um, when the school is set up, that people are going to be travelling by car by considerable distance. And as much as we want to encourage people to actually walk their children to school, um, we've got to think about the residents who are going to not be, going to be able to get out the drive. It's, it's going to be just bedlam with all the cars milling around, children trying to get out. And I, mean, I can't tell you. It just We just need them to look at it. Um, yeah, the school needs to happen. Um, and so, I, you know, thank you for the motion and the seconder to um, go, go with the recommendation. But it just needs that extra little push to um, highways and the school people to actually try and sort out these, these issues that are so, so important. Thank you. If Councillor Mason of the Borough is happy with that, I'm quite content to draft a cover letter that goes with the Borough Council's recommendation, emphasising those three points of highway pick-up and drop-off and the revision of the highway safety implications of crossing Kirkby Road round the roundabout to get down Sheepwash Way. That was talked about on the uh, on the papers here, um, and also about having to prevent errant parking, and that is one that is it is quite tight down there. And I know that one of the main things in Tullerton, and when I was in Ed Walton, and when I was elsewhere, was always parking and some of the uh, accidents that can happen with that. Apart from, you know, ambulances and etc. Uh, that uh, can't get through. Uh, I think parking is, is also an aspect. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Could it? Could there not be designated parking around the school? so that people aren't going along that lane and trying to turn round and being told to pay off, so that you have a, a you have a, people have a, you know, they can't just park along there. We can certainly ask the highway authority to consider traffic regulation orders to put things like yellow lines down there. Yeah. They would have to assess it against the appropriate criteria for whether that's reasonable or not. But again, it's within your gift as members yeah. to make whatever recommendation you want in that regard. So it's sort of a slightly different to usual planning applications. Mm -hmm. if, if you believe it's pertinent and relevant to the case, you can ask them to consider it. They've got to determine whether it's proportionate and appropriate to the scheme for developing it, considering there's nothing to stop members asking for that. Now, whether that's covered through the suggested condition 14, which is to prevent errant parking, um, as Councillor Thomas has pointed out, we dearly love all our kids to walk and cycle to school. But in some circumstances, that's not always practical, particularly when the catchment area is the entire village. Um, that said, the proposed school is only intended to be open for 12 months until the permanent school is open, at which point the road would be removed and the pedestrian and cycle access point would remain 
short term school. So again, if, if members wish us to, to make that comment, we can, and that's all. We'd certainly willingly agree to do so. I think it's worth noting that the temporary access road itself won't be available for people to drive down. The proposal is to have a gate at the end of that. So people the, the people will only be able to get as far as Hammer Head or Seaquash Road. And the parking restrictions, I think, in that area and along Seaquash Road, need to take account of the fact that the residents do need to park there. And it's just the school hours that are the problem, really. And quite a lot of schools do have parking um, restrictions that just cover the school pick-up and drop-off times, or just the school hours, and that might be something that could be looked at. Um, yeah. Thank you. I have no further speakers wishing other. I have one further point myself, and that is, although it's a temporary building, um, and for quite a short time, um, the council usually put a um, a security fence all the way around the area and I think it might be applicable in this given to its proximity to a public footpath. You're, you're quite right Chairman, um, there is a, a proposed fence, it is rightly or wrongly it is commonplace with modern education establishments that the children are kept in and others are kept out. And that's certainly no different with this proposal. There is a two metre high fence proposed around the school whilst it would be in operation. It's also suggested in the conditions that that would be removed um, where relevant within the scheme because I dare say the, the open space, the, the playing field would still be required to be fenced off to a certain extent, but the fencing may need to be reconfigured accordingly. Thank you very much for that. Um, Yes, well, we we'll always have to bear in mind we are, as the council team has been said several times, um, it's been proposed by um, Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Jones, that with the all the additional comments in the late representations, plus those mentioned this afternoon, um, it's been moved to act to tell the county that we um, do recommend um, with all the conditions. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Right, uh, good to be back. Last item of the uh, afternoon, I believe. Let's collect my thoughts. Um, on to the presentations, aren't we, first? Yes, right. All, all ready? Shall we go? Right, presentations, please. We could uh, be good. Thank you, Chairman. This application relates to two mature sycamore trees located in the rear garden of 31 Ed Walton Lodge, Coast Ed Walton. A late 1980 development set within the former railway footing. The two sycamores in question stand on top of an embankment approximately four metres above the level of the garden. The trees are protected by TPO and this application seeks to fell both of these trees. The applicant's justification for seeking consent to fell the trees is that they cause excessive shading of the neighbour's garden and, give their large, and given their large size are a danger to the applicant's house. Both the Lord Councillors have objected to the application on the grounds that based on the information received, there is no justification to fell the trees, and in addition to this, the trees could be pruned, trimmed and shaped. Removal of the trees is contrary to the county's climate emergency status, and the ecological impact of removal and replacement of these mature trees would be inadequate. One local resident has also objected 
and their concerns are set out in the report. But the main points can be summarised as no real justification, impact on wildlife and ecology, environmental impact, and contrary to local and national policy. The Council's Design and Landscape Officer has also commented that it does not object to the proposal of felling these trees, commenting that the trees raise concern to residents based around the risk of failure and loss of life dominating their properties below. There is little public amenity from the trees as they are largely screened by the properties on Ed Walton Lodge Close and also screened by trees and hedges from Machin's Lane. And there are more prominent trees behind the site on Rushcliffe own land. The amenity value of these trees does not increase for the residents, sorry, does increase for the residents of the Sharp Hill development, but an existing hedgerow which contains some mature trees, there should be little impact on the Sharp Hill residents. The removal of trees has been allowed in similar circumstances and there will be a planting buffer for the rear of the properties. Pruning would not be a solution as this will encourage new growth and, and, and create a need for regular pruning and maintenance. He also requests a condition for the replacement of trees should it be granted to fell these trees and using native species trees which flower and produce fruit for the benefit of wildlife. Policy position, policy position is set out in the report, but focuses on the need to recognise that the amenity value of the trees and the impact from the trees on the amenity of the area. Whether the proposed removal is justified if damage is likely to occur as a result of a refusal or conditional consent, impact on the protected species and the need to seek expert advice to inform the decision. And although climate change and native conservation can be taken into account, the main consideration in this case is the amenity value of the trees. Policy 37 of the LPP2 states that the adverse impact on mature trees must be avoided, mitigated, or if removed, if removal of the trees is justified, it should be replaced. Any replacement must follow the principle of right tree in the right place. There are a number of mature trees on the eastern side of Ed Walton Lodge Close, and although the trees subject to the application can be seen through a gap between 31 and 33 Ed Walton Lodge Close, only the tops of the trees form part of the street scene, so in that respect are of limited amenity value in the cul-de-sac. They are also, they're also viewed against the backdrop of large trees positioned to, in POS to the, to the rear of the site, located between the site and Sharp Hill, and the Sharp Hill development, and therefore their loss would not be significant. This area of open space is also subject to the planting scheme, inclu which includes native species and shrubs, further reducing the impact of the amenity of the removal of these trees. It is considered that the amenity value of the two sycamores viewed from Machin Lane is minimal and that the impact of their loss would not be significant either. Overall, officers consider that the amenity value of the trees is not particularly high, and given the generally Sylvian character of the area, the impact of the tree removal upon the existing character would be negligible. If permission is granted for the removal of the trees, there would be a requirement for their replacement, ensuring the replacement trees are appropriate for the site, considering the need to ensure the right trees in the right place. Officers suggest the replacement trees be crab apple, as recommended by the design and landscape officer. And will still provide a reasonable degree of amenity value, as well as improving wildlife value of the area. Having regard to the guidance within the MPPG, in this instance, it is considered that it could be appropriate to grant consent subject to replacement of trees, despite there being no apparent arboricultural justification for their removal. Other than the general statement about the trees posing a potential danger to their property, the applicant has not submitted any evidence that the trees have caused damage to their property or that they may do so in the future. Nevertheless, in line with the MPPG, the committee still needs to bear in mind the risk of compensation, any loss or damages caused as a result of the application being refused or granted subject to conditions. In the absence of any evidence having been produced by the applicant, officers consider that the risk of subsequent claim compensation being successful will be limited. 
Whilst the concerns in respect to the climate emergency is acknowledged, given government guidance in this regard, which is referred to in paragraph 21 of your report, it is not considered that such concerns on their own justify refusing an application in this instance. As outlined above, it is considered that removal of the tree tree sycamore trees can, in this instance, be justified by the fact that their amenity value is low. Furthermore, their replacements with native trees that would be more suitable for the embankment located at the top of the embankment could also provide an enhanced wildlife position, as well as amenity values could be secured by condition. As such, it is considered that granting consent for the application would be compliant with both policy 37 of the LPP2 and the MPPF. Whilst it is acknowledged that the true sycamore, two sycamore trees have the potential to provide habitat for protected species, it is the applicant's responsibility to ensure that no protected species are disturbed. Officers also consider that any initial loss of biodiversity habitat could be restored in time by suitable native for trees being planted. And a condition can be att attached to the consent if, if, it, if the committee feel to grant such to ensure this takes place. Overall, it is considered that the felling of the two sycamore trees can be justified in this instance, particularly as the trees are not of any great age and do not provide significant amenity value to the area. In addition, it is considered that the application were, if the application were granted, subject to the suggested, suggested tree replacement condition, there would be an opportunity to replace the two non-native species with two native species trees that, that would be more suitable on the elevated embankment in its location and would provide better amenity value in terms of existing landscape character, as well as improved biodiversity wildlife value to the area too. Having regard to the matters outlined in the report, it is considered that on balance, the application to fell the two sycamore trees can be recommended for approval, subject to a condition requiring the trees to be replaced during the first planting season following their felling. It is therefore recommended that, this, that consent is granted subject to the conditions as outlined in your report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cook. We have um, one speaker, one of the um, ward members, Councillor Robinson, if you'd like to take the chair. I don't think I need to go through all the detail, do I? We'll just say five minutes when you press the button. Thank you. Well, let me just get my papers uh, ready a second, please, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Chairman. I'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll begin now. I think it's uh, the irony one that lost on members of the committee that we're talking about uh, chopping down mature, healthy, carbon reducing trees in the week that we've had um, COP26. We've announced that this uh, authority over 8,000 trees that we've planted. As I said, we've uh, announced a climate emergency. But officers today have proposed to you to actually chop down these majestic, healthy, trees with preservation orders on them. I'll just uh, go through a couple of points about this. First, in terms of the application, the applicant has been mentioned has actually shown no evidence. The two uh, reasons for going to, tree, to remove these trees was first of all about uh, the shame of the neighbor's house. The neighbors made no representation. I've tried to contact that neighbor, hasn't made any contact whatsoever. You have no representation in your notes. Danger to the house, uh, remind uh, members of the committee, in fact, the applicant actually ticked in there that there's been no fears of break or fall of branches and no damage at all to the house. So he's actually confirmed the application, there is no damage. So what you have in front of you, what officers have recommended, is to kill these trees. And I use the word kill, that's not... Uh, mess around with the language about felling, kill these trees with absolutely no evidence. They are majestic, they are healthy, they have no disease, and yet you are recommended to actually kill them. I also remind members that there's been no um, arbitrary cultural report with this at all, either from officers or from the applicant, i.e. specialists. So you have absolutely no supporting evidence in terms of shading, or danger to the house at all. 
The other point measuring, as the officer quite rightly said, about the MPPF, they use this word amenity. Definition of amenity, quality of character of the area and elements that contribute to the overall enjoyment of the area. How can two majestic sycamore trees not enhance an area? That is absolutely beyond me. And I'm sorry, if the weight is amenity, I know a lot of people who are desperate have this sort of tree line surrounding them. Particularly, as been mentioned, next to them is the Sharfield development, where we have destroyed acres and acres of land, right? It's only development, killed hundreds of trees, hundreds of bushes have been removed, and yet where we have something on the boundaries here, which I think absolutely improves the amenity, both for the people that actually live on the drive and in Sharfield as well. In terms of the other points of the MPPF about other considerations, as the officer mentioned about policy 24, that you will not remove mature trees unless it's justified. The justification you put in front of you about shading and danger, which absolutely not supported at all. As far as I'm concerned, and the reason why I'm here today is there is absolutely no justification to remove these trees. As it starts the sycamores themselves, uh, 1987 the TPO was put on these. These include an incredible amount they contribute to biodiversity. And I make no apology, I spoke to the uh, Woodland Trust about this, how vital they are to the biodiversity around them. Their flowers and their seeds drop, they feed badgers, foxes, hedgehogs. They're home to over 250 species of insects, aphids, such as ladybirds, such as flies, hedgehogs, as I say, dependent on them as well. They provide absolutely vital shelter to many, many birds. And remind members, last summer, these trees were all very, very heavily nested by a lot of birds. Now, as you've been uh, put to you about replacement trees, and let me say, crab trees, absolutely fantastic. What they absolutely failed to mention, it could take 10 years for a crab tree to provide any contribution to biodiversity. That's if it takes. So you cut these trees down, plant these native trees, could take 10 years. So what do we actually say to the animals, the That's birds that depend on these trees? Go away for 10 years until we actually, this actually grows. That's if it actually does. I don't think that's absolutely acceptable at all in today's climate. And also just to uh, point out, there is actually a national shortage of crab trees as well. So will you be able to plant them in this time scale? I don't know. As I said, Woodland Trust said a high percentage actually don't take. And if you notice in the recommendation there, you do have to five years, you haven't got to do anything. So in five years, if these things don't take, then it actually goes. So in summary, yeah. members of the committee. Don. I, sorry, between shall we? Well, sorry, I'm just saying, putting it all to you, that I do not think it's absolutely acceptable to take these majestic, mature, and healthy trees down. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, are there any responses, Mr. Cook, to that? I don't think there are any questions as such. Did you pick anything up? Apart from emphasising that when, you know, we need to judge this on their amenity value, um, and as the report states, we don't feel there's significant amenity value of these trees to justify refusal of the proposal. Thank you. Right, I think um, time is marching on. Um, not that I want to start a debate, but I think we ought to now discuss this application and come to a decision. I, I've had indication Councillor Phillips would like to start the debate, so over to you, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Jim. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, been along to the site and viewed uh, the, the trees in question from the roadside. Um, I've seen how steep the bank is, and I actually think that those trees and the root systems on those trees are helping to support those uh, steep banks from actually sliding into those gardens. Um, particularly in heavy rainfall, they'll be absorbing lots and lots of uh, water um, and actually makes the bank a lot safer. The trees appear to be very healthy. Um, I, I see no reason why, you know, they should be felled. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Actually, I was more or less going to say a similar thing because uh, the, the, there was two big trees next to my house. Okay, they were rotten at the bottom. They were 
and I've also really used for doing it, and I was quite sad about it. But a decision had to be made because as councillor Mitchell said, when you chop, if you were to chop those trees down uh, and the roots died, I was warned that actually that would be quite dangerous because then it would fall in onto the, the ditch and I would flood even more. So um, they are really quite near to that bank and I have been to those houses and I have been, um, perhaps I nearly bought one, but, um, and they are quite, quite close. And it is a very, very steep bank. I can understand that, yes, it probably does block some light because um, where the base of them are is, is very high up. But I still think there could be repercussion if they were um, chopped down and the roots died and the bank would then start, could start in heavy rain over the winter to fall down the ditch. Thank you, Councillor Butler, then Councillor Gray. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Well, the Councillor Robinson referred, and, and indeed the report uh, refers to overshadowing of the neighbour's garden, but um, uh, am I correct in understanding that the neighbour hasn't actually made a complaint or, uh, or spoken to us about the application? That's correct. Councillor Gray. Um, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a large sycamore in my garden and um, we, um, we had someone around to have a look to check the condition of the tree. Um, one of our neighbours on seeing this uh, came around almost immediately to, uh, to check that we weren't cutting the tree down um, because of, they, well, they enjoy watching the birds. And um, since, since living there for the last sort of 10 years, um, more and more people have, have mentioned if, if, if that great big sycamore at the end of your garden people sort of five, six, seven doors down can, can see this tree. So, so trees of this size do have a, a great amenity to, to more than those people who just have them at the end of their garden. They're, they're, they're seen from a, um, from a wide range um, and, and also they have a different amenity throughout the year. Um, my children have had a great enjoyment watching the, uh, the sycamore change colour, come into bud, um, release its keys. Um, so um, I think these are, are of, of a great amenity to the area and I think they'll become Great humanity as the rest of the Sharpley development fills out. Thank you. Councillor Thomas. Uh, yes, I agree. Trees should be innocent until pro proved guilty, Chair. Yes, very well put. <laughs> Councillor Jones. Yeah, I, I don't want to add to what people have already said, which I agree with. But uh, just a comment about the officer's report. Um, in some instances, uh, I remember we, where. where we have approved the removal of a tree, it required its replacement by two. So two for one. And I just make that comment for, for people to take note of, really. Thank you. Are we all done? Are we ready to take a vote? I think we probably proposed nobody's that. proposed. I need a proposed and a seconder. Proposed Councillor Mason, seconder Councillor Laurie. Chair, can I just clarify that the motion is to, uh, yeah, the proposal. Oh, yeah, There's a report. Are we voting for the re recommendation of the report? To remove the trees. The recommendation of the report. So I'll repeat on that. Are we voting to refuse the recommendation of the report? Yes. We need a reason. amenity but um, they are an, amen an amenity in the sense that other pre people obviously appreciate them. I'm sure the birds do and uh, all the animals too. Also there is the issue of that high bank and the safety and those roots must be uh, go a long way down and uh, that helps support a very high bank that there is at the bottom of these people's gardens. And once one part of the bank starts to go, then it can go along. So, yeah. Is that a reason? Is that a thing? Yeah. 
Um, I think the most substantial reason for refusal would be that um, it, it, it wasn't, they do um, make an impact on um, the view from mm -hmm. another way, mm -hmm. and that they are perfectly healthy trees which show no sign of um, deteriorating at this point, present time. And they also have a PTO order on which was put on at yeah. some stage. So, um, for them to be protected, and uh, I believe they still should be protected. So you're proposing, oh, oh no, it's right. Councillor Thomas. Uh, there's no evidence of um, any disease to the tree, um, and there's no evidence actually of any harm to the immune tube delivering um, from the tree. Um, you know, they've stated that it could show no discount, but they haven't actually you know, substantiated that at all. Thank you. So, Councillor Mason, are you basically proposing something along the lines to um, not, not, not uh, to refuse the permission on the basis that, that they are healthy trees, the amenities, there's a tree preservation order on them, uh, and they contribute to the stabilisation of the bank for those who wish you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mr Ashcroft. Um, Chairman, I would just give you some advice, and I'd be slightly nervous about the issue over the stability of the bank. Plainly, that, that may be an issue that members are concerned about, but plainly tree preservation orders are about the integrity of the tree and the dignity of the area, and that for most of your reasons for refusal are addressing material planning considerations that relate to the tree. To get into technical issues without any evidence, I think is a, a slightly dangerous area, and I would actively discourage you from doing that. That's but, a fair point. But, we have no but, but plainly, plainly your, your, your issues over lack of any arboriculturally detail and the immunity offered by those trees are clearly material considerations, which you as members have taken into account in your discussion. Thank you. Good point. We have no technical evidence about the stability of the bank. Um, so it's around the TPO, uh, the health of the trees, uh, the immunity, the wider context. Is, I think. Yeah. Happy with that, Councillor Mason. Right. We need a second, don't we? I'll give Councillor Thomas it this time. Councillor. So we could go to the vote now, I think. We have a proposal, we have a second, we have a valid motion. I think it's time to, re to refuse the recommendation of the report. I think we can go to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just to clarify, it's refused consent because it's a, a tree preservation order rather than permission as we would normally have. Um, and just with your leave, Chair, for officers to work up those reasons into a, a more comprehensive paragraphs. Yes, yes, I think that's a fair point. Thank refused, you, Chair. Refused consent, yeah. Yeah, so um, all those in favour to refuse consent. That's 11, Chair, unanimous. Thank you. I think that concludes today's business. It's been a long afternoon, but uh, thank you for your contributions. I thank you to the officers for the presentations. A lot of work goes into those reports. Very well aware of that, but um, we'll formally close the meeting and uh, 